Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to call this meeting to order. Let us now have a moment of silence. Let us stand and pledge allegiance to the flag. Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll? Yes, sir. Mr. Bryant? Present. Ms. Bryson Morsberger? Here. Ms. Dooley? Dr. Kraft? Present. Ms. McKeever? Here. Mr. Morris? Yes. Ms. Torres? Yes. And our student rep, Mr. Johnson? Present. Thank you, Madam Clerk. I move that we make a motion for the approval of the agenda. I so move. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Now, this time, we will have comments from the community. We welcome comments, and speakers are encouraged uh, to keep their comments to three minutes. So when you come to the podium, please state your name and address. So I have the list in front of me. So it's Derek Hartline here. Good evening, board members and superintendent, Dr. Gurley. My name is Derek Hartline, lifelong city resident. I am back to talk about the renaming process of our schools. When it was first brought to the board in April, 2021, you were told the committee would be doing it in a way that our community would want. Is that being done? Here we are two years later. How would you grade the process, committee's work and, in your, and your involvement? In your lessons learned, have you been completely transparent? The basis for considering this entire name change comes down to research. Two years ago, you said that Phil Varner's research was a starting place and a baseline. If most of his research is taken from Wikipedia type publications, it cannot be considered scholarly without knowing the contributors. Why did you not contact unbiased historians or a consulting firm? The committee stated his research is just one source, but where are the others? Last month, I brought to the board's attention that Blue Mountain is not from here, and was only created to give Burley Moran the initials BME. Only one board member questioned my findings while another one actually defended the name. However, the news asked the facilitator about Blue Mountain. It was quoted that there really isn't one around here. I believe the community deserves honest transparency for the process, research, cost, and why one school was given special treatment. You were told the process wasn't a race and there is no time limit. Yet when Clark staff asked for more time, it was denied. Now you want, on a, you want to vote on affirming name change and are asking the public for more time, which you would not grant. To do this devalues Clark's request. The notification about not picking names yet only went to Johnson, Burley Moran families, all CCS staff, but everyone else had to go back six news stories on the CCS website or read about it in the media over a week later. Some board members disregarded the vote Clark students wanted and it caused a real bitter disagreement among the board members. When Johnson students voted, they wrote in the most votes to keep the name the same. So if you vote tonight to proceed with change, you're once again sending a clear message to the Southside Elementary Schools that their vote is less important. A board member mentioned last month that they have a hard time telling kids why we name schools for individuals who may have an asterisk by their name. I would rather tell those same children the history of their school versus tell them their vote isn't important. Instead of voting on names of schools, why doesn't the board focus on redrawing the elementary school zones so there is equity among all schools and it isn't based on what side of the tracks you live on? 
why does the school system want to tackle the bigger issues that goes way past what name is on a building? In two and a half years, there has been no details on the total cost to rename these schools. If the committee really and truly wants to be taken seriously, you need to postpone tonight's vote, prove to us this isn't a race, and that you want to make a right decision for the entire community. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hartline. Mr. Rob Warner. Hello, <clears throat> I'm Donald Robert Warner, Rob Warner, live at 712 Highland Avenue, Johnson Village, Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, I've lived there since 1970, have two daughters that attended and graduated from Johnson School, have one grandson and one granddaughter that have both graduated. I wanna keep Johnson School's name, James G. Johnson. He was the most moderate of all the names on the schools during the Jim Crow era, 16, I mean 1870 to recently. Song for Johnson School is Hail to James G. Johnson with love and honor. Okay, I'm gonna use my words for your project. Uh, your present project really started about 2010. Stage one was the first part, not your part. Stage one, in my terms, a good guy's book burning of the Confederate statues in Virginia. Hitler was big on book burning. You destroy books to remove factual history. I am glad the statues are gone, thank God. Stage two is your assignment. Your assignment is to book burn all the teachers' names off the schools from the Jim Crow era, off the schools. The schools, you are the good guys, but I want you to save one name, James G. Johnson as an example of Jim Crow times. You should write a little history about how complicated that is. And that way, if you keep that name, people like me can't say you burned all the books. You understand? I have one more thing to say. Thank you. Why did I come up with this different look? At what's going on came from you folks you're the ones that suddenly caused the book burning to come into my mind and it's what you said in this little news article some have expressed that changing the names of schools belittles and contributes uh, the namesakes made to the school sherry craft another board member echoed Mossberger's statement by adding that the action is intended, is not intended to disparage or reduce any person or their accomplishments. Removing the name of a person should not lessen their accomplishments, she said. The committee agrees. Your actions look like, I disagree with you. Your actions look like your burning books. I'd like you to create a story about Johnson and use it as an example. Uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Because it's a different view. Thank you, Mr. Warner. You're welcome. Ms. Jen Horn. Um, hello, I'm Jen Horn. Charlottesville High School. Um, I was so excited last meeting about the potential future formation of a committee that the school board would be using to investigate our cell phone issue at the school. Um, I didn't see it on this month's agenda. So I'm assuming that it is still a seed that has been planted in 
really amazing fertile earth. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing about that committee. Many of us are. I'm, I'm here representing a number of people who are like, couldn't come for different reasons. But we are excited to see what that committee um, comes up with. And please know that there are many teachers and administrators here at CHS who, wow, who would be excited to be questioned and also students, um, students who have a lot to say about the issue as well. So thank you for voicing that last meeting. And I look forward to seeing what happens when I come back next meeting. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Horn. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to come forth and speak? Come forth and state your name and address. Good evening. I am Chuck Moran. I live at 932 Bing Lane in Charlottesville. Dr. Gurley, Mr. Bryant, members of the school board, I believe that we can all agree that schools are one of the most important parts of any community. Schools are integral to the identity of a community, to its cohesion and continuity over the decades. Schools are a part of the colorful fabric, a layer of true strength that interlaces and binds a community together. When you undertake changing the names of any of the schools, much less when you choose to change nearly all of them at once, you do risk damaging that fabric and tearing holes in the identity and the cohesion of the community. It's always advisable to follow best practices to keep this damage to a minimum. And I do regret to acknowledge that I don't see best practices at play in the current effort to change our school's names. As a native of Charlottesville, a resident of the community, an alumnus of both Venable and Lane, and as the father of a Burnley Moran student, I see a process at play that doesn't quite measure up to what I would have expected from our school board. But I have a suggestion and I have questions. There's no need to take notes. I'll email this document to you all. When it came to Burnley Moran and Venable, why was the public survey open for just three weeks? School names affect the entire community and less than 1% of our community participated in the survey. What was the distribution plan? Why doesn't it represent a cross section of our community? Other communities have taken months, not weeks to get public feedback. What are the costs of changing school names? Other communities, including Richmond, are looking at $25,000 to $50,000 per school. By that measure, we're looking at $210,000 to $350,000 to change their name, to, our, to change our na school's names. Do the citizens of Charlottesville want to make that investment in changing school names, or would they prefer that the funds go to teacher salaries, improving facilities, and making up for COVID learning loss? Why don't we don't know what their input would be because we have not been able to see the cost projections. What is the total cost and plan for avoiding confusion over changing the names of polling places? Six schools either are or will be polling places shortly and with elections coming up in a couple of months, the registrar does not have funds in her budget for this change. She has had to appeal to city council for additional funds. As you know, my great aunt Sarepta Moran is the namesake for Burnley Moran Elementary. Why is it necessary to continue to disparage her name by linking from the school's name webpage to Phil Varner's opinion piece that misrepresents her membership in the, in the United Daughters of the Confederacy with completely unsubstantiated claims about her activities in that organization? Mr. Varner has not responded to our request for his sources and we can find nothing in the public databases to support his claims. And his claims have led people in our community to refer to Sarepta Moran as a bigot, a segregationist, and a racist. When are you going to unlink and repudiate this unfact checked pair of documents? Last, I said I had a suggestion. During this pause, which I commend that you all have initiated over the new names for Burnley Moran and Johnson, why not take the time to reflect on the overall process and fix the issues about public input, cost transparency, polling place names, and unsubstantiated claims against some of our formerly revered educators. Then call a widely publicized meeting and reveal the policies, the cost, and the process going forward so our community is fully informed. 
our schools and the fabric of our community deserve that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other members that are present in this room that would like to come forth and speak at this time? Ms. Como, do we have anyone in the Zoom room? Thank you so much for each one of you all who came forth tonight to speak. Dr. Odie will now come forth with her presentation. Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening. I want to start by telling you a bit about the equity certificate cohort. Tonight, we are recognizing staff who self-selected to work with Dr. Denise Johnson for seven months towards this certificate. Each month consisted of four components, readings or recordings, which helped frame the topic for the month, in-person and virtual learning of specific topics, homework, homework, writing journals and reflections, practice and applications, and applying those skills that they learned, and reflection. They facilitated in-person and virtual discussion based on the month's work. Topics included in this work were identity, implicit bias, history of education and local history, asset-based instruction, the power of language, responsive language and communication, differentiated instruction, accelerated learning for all, and responsive classrooms. All of this work culminated with participants leading their own professional learning sessions for our March Professional Learning Day. Congratulations to the following who have earned their certificate of completion under the guidance of Dr. Denise Johnson. <laughs> She's defending tonight. <laughs> Please come forward as I call your name to receive your certificate. And we will ask at the end, I'm gonna ask that you go stand up front and we'll have our board chair and vice chair to stand with you. April Brown. Dr. Jill Dahl. Bridget Drain. Matthew Farley. Is Joseph French here tonight? Muggsy Marini. Gabriella Moore. Eric, Dr. Erica Pierce. And we, again, we can't forget the fearless leader, Dr. Denise Johnson. Congratulations, everyone. And so now we're ready for our picture. Thank you and congratulations again. Next on the agenda is Mr. Andy Jones, Director of Student Activities. Up here. Oh, yeah, 
Yeah, we're going to follow the same process. That seemed to work well. So we're going to have our athletes line up over here. And then as we call you through, we'll have you come over there so we can get a picture. All right. Uh, good evening, uh, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Uh, it's an honor to serve as a CHS Director of Student Activities. And ex I'm excited to be here tonight as we honor a few of our student athletes. Um, for our first honor, we're excited to have Preston Burton, a senior student athlete at CHS. A few months back, uh, we came to congratulate Preston and his team, uh, and especially Preston on his Virginia Class 3 state championship in golf. Uh, Preston, was uh, he's going to play next year at William & Mary. Um, he is a four-time All-District first team member, two-time District Player of the Year, two-time Regional Player of the Year, and two-time All-State honoree. And tonight we wanted him here to present him with his state championship ring in appreciation for his accomplishment at CHS as our first state champion in golf. Preston, please come on up and accept this token from Charlottesville City Schools. You gotta show them too. <laughs> Next, I would like to take a few minutes to acknowledge some incredible student athletes from our past winter season that had some very impressive accomplishments. The first winter student athlete that we would like to acknowledge, uh, unfortunately is not here tonight, he's, he's home sick, is Seth Noel. Uh, this winter, Seth uh, was, was Seth's first year um, participating in an indoor track. Uh, he is a junior, um, but he decided I wanna try something new. Um, and I, he, he excelled immediately. Uh, and the biggest event that he excelled in was the triple jump. Um, and this year at the state championship meet, Seth jumped 45 feet, nine inches and won the 3A state championship in indoor track for triple jump. So if Seth is at home, congratulations. Our next group of student athletes that we would like to highlight is our boys swim relay team, consisting of Dylan Halbert, Quinn Ragsdale, Teddy Buckner, and Will Keenan. This group finished second in, three, in the 3A state where they broke a school record in three different relays. They broke their own school record that they broke previously in the year in the 200 yard medley relay with a time of 131.38, which was last set in 1991. In the 200 yard freestyle relay, they broke the old record that was previously set back in 2001 with a time of 130.35. They also broke the 400 yard freestyle relay school record with a time of 318.83, which was last set in 2001. This group helped propel the CHS boys swim team to a sixth place finish overall in the state and smashed school records along the way. Please, please give this group a hand. Good morning. Our next student athlete of honor is freshman Elena Pierce. And I emphasize freshman because as a young student athlete at CHS, Elena has already taken the school record in three events. Actually, it was four because of yesterday. Uh, three events, one for cross country and two for indoor track. This fall, Elena broke the school record in the 5K with a time of 1831 in the Jefferson District Championship. In the winter season, while she was also competing for the varsity basketball team, Elena also competed in indoor track and qualified for states. At the state championship, Elena broke two CHS school records, one in the 1600 meter run in which she finished fifth in the state with a time of 51655. That's fast, y'all. And another school record in the 3200 meter run with a time of 1139, which placed her third in the state. We are excited to see what the future holds for this very talented student athlete. Congrats, Elena, come on up. Our next student athlete that we wanna highlight is Jalen Lynch. Jalen Lynch recently signed her letter of intent with an athletic scholarship to run at, at Winthrop University. Yeah. Jalen earlier in the season broke the school record in the 55 meter hurdles with a time of 8.68 seconds. And yes, all that's fast as well. Uh, and at the state championship, Jalen placed second in the state in the 55 meter hurdles which at any, other, at any other group, she would have finished first. Jalen is a fierce competitor that will smile, smile at you as she blows past you on the track. And we are so excited for her collegiate journey where we know she'll make big things happen. 
just a moment. And finally, we'll move to the wrestling mat. We want to honor Javier Castaneda. Javi was a sub-regional champion, the Jefferson District runner-up, the regional runner-up, fifth place in the state, and is currently being courted for collegiate wrestling opportunities. His overall career record of 108 to 42 is second best in school history behind Wade Kamoff, who graduated nine years ago. And he's the last Black Knight to place in the state, also earning fifth. Javi has been an excellent leader, a tireless, tireless preparer, and a fount of wrestling knowledge, experience, and tactics for his entire competitive journey. He will be sorely missed by our wrestling program, but we look forward to his visit home from college next year when he will no doubt offer up all that he has learned to the next generation. Thank you, Javi. Come on up. I appreciate you allowing me the time to acknowledge these student athletes, and I hope to come back at the end of our spring season with some, some more praises of our amazing student athletes that we have here in Charlottesville City Schools. Thank you. Again, thank you once again to all of our CHS athletes and to our equity uh, certificate cohort recipients. Now, Dr. Gurley. Um, Mr. Bryant, we uh, want to recognize our new safety coordinator, uh, if she could stand for us. We have, uh, let me introduce to you Ms. Regine Wright. Um, she is serving as our new safety coordinator for our school division, where she will oversee our crisis management, uh, monitoring of our security, uh, care safety assistance. Um, she brings to us a wealth of experience, and I think we are definitely going to be better because of her service. She has served in the capacity um, of police officer with C CPD. She's also, um, she served as an officer, and she also was the first Black female detective um, prior to coming to us. She served as a magistrate. Um, and she just has a whole lot of other skills. Um, I think she speaks some, um, is it Dwali? Farsi. Yes, she speaks Farsi. So she has a wide range of skills that I do not possess. And I'm glad that you do. Thank you so much for joining us. If we could just give her another round of applause. Welcome aboard, Ms. Wright. I would like to um, recognize our student rep for the Charleston City School Board, Mr. Deshaun Johnson. Would you please stand and be recognized? I'd like to welcome you aboard. So happy to have you. Next on our agenda, um, I move that, um, that we adopt the consent agenda. Is there a motion? Um, I move we adopt the consent agenda. Second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. All right. We um, have a couple of action items. The first thing is um, Dr. Baptist with the school naming. Chairman Bryant, members of the board, Dr. Gurley. Uh, last month, we did bring recommendations for Burnley Moran and for Johnson. And since that time, there's been a lot of discussion about these names and a uh, decision made to pause on the names at this point. Uh, since that time, information has been shared with the community. Information was sent to all school staff in an update and information was sent also to um, the families from the two schools. 
and asking for some recommendations. We have started getting some recommendations, which I will be sharing with the committee and um, hopefully at one point we'll bring some to, uh, to you as well. Uh, we're also going to have the company that has been working with the strategic plan to do some work with the school staffs and so that we can really delve, delve into this and, and get the name that we feel like is the best name for each of the schools. Um, there will be you know, additional faculty meetings. And so once all of this is done and we've had a lot of thought and, and more thought about it, we will bring names back to the board for consideration. Um, at this time though, we do ask that the board vote to, uh, to give the commitment that we do believe that the names of these schools do need to be changed and for us to continue with the overall process. Um, I do know that there has been a concern about polling places and we did have a question about that last week from the media. And just to make sure that the public knows that as things move and polling places changes or school names change, Charlottesville City Schools is committed to do whatever we can to help make that process more seamless for our um, community. And so we will do whatever we can to help that process, realizing it may be concern for um, folks as we are getting ready for the vote. So I would ask if the board um, would uh, vote to make sure that we are continuing with the process to change the names. So um, I move that we make a motion to change the names or, or are we supposed to have a discussion first? Um, no, I can't, that's right, I can't, <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. So I'll start with, I guess, Mr. Johnson on this end, if you like to discuss. Well, I move that we make a motion. I need a motion. I need a motion. All right, you want me to do it? Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see if I can get this one right. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I move that we um, continue with the process of uh, renaming the schools, or I guess at this point it's our elementary schools, uh, that we continue the process that was begun and that we, um, we recommit ourselves to the idea that we, we are going to change the names of these schools. Okay. Do we have a second? Dr. Kraft, may I ask for clarification? Yeah. So this motion that we're making is, is to continue with the process yes. moving forward, but we are pausing on taking action mm -hmm. for any specific name at That's this right. time. Yes. Maybe we should include that in the motion that... Uh, it, there's yes. no recommendation to vote on the names for Burnley Moran and Johnson no. at this time. That is on pause. No, at this mm -hmm. point, we're, we're not um, voting on any specific names or any more specific schools at this point. We're pausing. What was your motion? Re just repeat your motion again. <laughs> <good>. <laughs> well, I, I move that we, um, uh, that we continue the, the process, a process of renaming our schools um, and that we are committed to the fact that we do want to rename our elementary schools at this point. Um, that we, and that we take a pause in uh, uh, choosing any specific names for schools as we, well, that we just take a pause, but that we are committing to uh, continue the process of renaming. Is there a second? I move that we pause the process. Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Oh, yeah, discussion. I'll start with you, Ms. McKeever. <laughs> okay, I just, um, I have no, uh, again, I feel like there's been a lot of 
issues with the process and I think a pause is required before we commit to anything. Um, and I think the first thing that we need to commit to is a process that is something that we can all as a school board stand behind. And so I look forward to the um, consultants ideas about how to proceed um, and include as many community members as possible in that discussion. And um, just to have as uh, transparent of a process as possible. So that's all. Ms. Morris. Ms. Morris and Grover. Um, I, I, when we met, I didn't agree with pausing the process only because three weeks, three months, three years, I don't think that if you don't want the name changed or you have a problem with the names, I don't think any amount of time or polling will change that. And the we're changing a name. Yes, it's not, uh, there's in the Blue Mountain near the school. Uh, can we change it to another name? Can we paint a Blue Mountain as a more mural and have the students partake in it? It's still a name. And I feel like there's a million reasons that keep coming forth not to do it. The time amount on the polls, they are gonna be polling places. There are polling places every year, I believe. Like, isn't there an election in Virginia? So there are always gonna be polling places. There's always gonna be a reason not to do these things. I guess my hesitation is the, the problems with the process that if you have a problem with the process, what exact problems do you have? And what would you like to see? So if three weeks isn't enough, will three months be enough if it doesn't come back with the answer that you want? Um, I didn't, I wasn't on the committee. I didn't pick any of the names. I'm okay trusting the committee in the process. I think that if you have an issue with it, you should be a part of the committee. You should be a part of the discussion and you should show up there as well. I don't know if people have or not, um, and the links on the websites and the information, you know, if, if I don't understand correctly, if the Daughters of the Confederacy is a benevolent organization that I've just misunderstood, then please put something out there. But, you know, I was just on their site and they're talking about their mission. They, they are against anyone who would use Confederate imagery for racist type, you know, things, but if you're, if you're fighting on the side for slavery, AKA the Confederacy, that in itself to me constitutes a level of racism, but I uh, have never, you know, I, I don't know too much about the daughters of the Confederacy. So maybe I have it all wrong, but I just remember when we got this idea to change the names, there was a lot of groundswell to do it in the moment. Um, I think it was around the time the Black Lives Matters protest. And it's like the further we get away from that, we were losing momentum to what we were saying before was that these, they hearken back to an era of white supremacy. We can discuss it, we can have a history discussion about it, but I, I, I just don't think that anything but leaving it the same is going to make like oh, some people who disagree with it happy. Um, and one of the speakers was right. It does matter what happens in the buildings as well as the names on the buildings. All of those things matter. Um, but either we're committed to change or we're leaving it the same. This is a new, um, a new, just a new place for me to be in that because I always worked under the assumption that things do change. You move forward and you change with the times. Um, and so I, I think it's okay to change with the times. I think it's okay to tell a full history. I, the same way I didn't think the statues coming down erased history, I don't think changing a name erases history. Um, so I wasn't, I, I don't think it, it necessarily needs to be slowed down. I don't think there needs to be an arborist or a horticulturalist or a consultant. I think that we can commit ourselves to changing a name, but so much has gone into the research of what we could change it to. And there 
to my knowledge, was no issues with the names being what they were with any type of problematic histories. And maybe um, the Johnson namesake was the most progressive of his time, but for people that look like me who could not go to the schools, it's, it, it, there is no, like, there's no, it, it's still the same, like being progressive during segregation, but still being, school still being segregated, I don't know what the delineation is. And the asterisk I mentioned, I mentioned that to my kids all the time because I grew up in Richmond. So I explained to them why they're Confederate statues. And I explained to them, I don't know why people fought for slavery. So whether the name gets changed or not, I will continue to have an asterisk because that's part of, I mean, it's part of being a black person in America is that there's always an asterisk. There's always a like, oh, well, back then you couldn't go or that person, you know, it was segregated at the time, but they were a good person. And that's all fine and dandy, but I feel like the, the process is muddled only because we're, we're, you know, hesitant in making the change. I don't have a problem with making a change. Okay, Dr. Craig. Well, thank you for those reflections. I appreciate that. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I think it is, I'm, I'm on the committee and I do think it's important that we do continue with the process, with a process. Um, I am in favor of the pause because um, I, think, I think how we go about this is as important as the final result. And um, sometimes, and you know, we're, we're all in this community. I think we all have some strong feelings. We've heard some of these feelings. And I do think there's some value in having somebody from outside of this particular community come in and, um, you know, just make sure all the pieces are in alignment. Um, you know, things sometimes look different uh, to somebody from the outside. So I, I am in favor of, of uh, doing that and pausing it, but only pausing it, um, you know, not for a long time, but for, you know, just, um, you know, modest amount of time uh, so that we can continue with the kind of commitment that we had. We want, we did, the board, has been behind the idea that we, um, in choosing different names for schools, we're just gonna move away from naming schools after people, the best people in the world, but we're just not going to do that because it's very fraught. And so, you know, that leaves us needing to um, be really clear on the criteria that we wanna use for the schools, the idea of place or purpose, um, and I think um, we want to come out of this feeling good and feeling united as a community. So I do think this pause will be helpful for that. Ms. Torres. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, I, I am in favor of the pause as well for many of the reasons stated. Um, I, I also do want to just make a point that um, I, I trust and I know that we, the schools, will continue to work closely with the city. I know that there is actually money that has been allocated um, to address polling and the elections and this year and then the next year. So that money was set aside and was included um, in the city's budget work session. So um, I know that, that that will be and is on their mind as well as ours to ensure that people know where they're going and if name changes go into effect uh, before this fall's elections or the following with the presidential election, that, that we will do our part on this end of it. Um, and, I, and I think it's important. And I think we are trying to be transparent. I think we've put a lot of information out there about what we're doing and why we're doing it. And I think it's important to us to, to do better. And, and that's what some of this pause is about. Thank you. Mr. Johnson. 
Yeah, I just first say I'm really happy to be back <laughs> to uh, address issues like this. This is why I um, signed up to do a position like this, is to have these deep conversations with the public and with the board. Um, I first want to say uh, before I, you know, this is my first meeting, I have had the perception of the public. Um, I've seen this from the public's uh, side of, you know, trying to figure out why are we renaming these schools? Uh, what was the process? You know, what even started this? And so I really want us to take a look back at, first of all, what was the reason of us restarting these names and trying to figure out what we should name these names instead of what they are? Because I feel like in the process, we're losing the meaning and we're losing the fire of why we want this done so bad, why we're pushing for this so bad. We're not doing this just because we believe that these names, are, you know, they're not good enough or just because, you know, they're not the right names for the image of Sargent City Schools. These names are affecting people. These names are names that are not representing the culture of Salt City Schools the way that they should. Um, as a student, to, to, before I knew anything about the names, like I said, I think a lot of the confusion comes from not a lot of people know about what these names stand for. Not a lot of these people know these people, who these people were before the schools were even you know, created. And so me doing my own research to say that I've gone to these elementary schools, I've gone to the, through this system, not knowing that these, some of the people who these schools were named of were not in support of me being in their schools or not being in support of other minority races or groups being in these buildings. Not only do I feel a way, I feel like I'm, you know, it's like being in a building which you were not invited in or were not wanted and you didn't know until you left. You're not gonna feel good after that. So as a senior leaving these schools, not knowing that throughout the 12 years I was here that I, if those people were still in these buildings today, I would not have been wanted. And I was walking through their school at their name entitled by them. I want you to put yourself in those shoes of being a student like me, a black student walking through a school in which the person that school was named after did not want you in that school, how you would feel when you left and knowing it after the fact knowing that you couldn't have an effect on what that name was when you were there, knowing that you didn't have a say or anything until you left because you weren't even knowledge on it. And that's another issue. I believe that we not only need to take action on it, but we have to start educating each other <clears throat> on these type of topics. This is a school system. We educate people here. Why are so many people confused on the names and confused about the meanings and confused about the history we have history classes for a reason. Why do people not know the history of their own city? We should be learning about this so that we were not so confused and debating on what these names should be or why they should be renamed. If we, I'm pretty sure, and I, I, this is just me just having faith in the community, that if we were all educated on the history behind these names and the history of the city in general, from Vinegar Hill to everything, we would be more all in favor of the changes needed to take place, not only in these schools, but within the city itself. Now, I wanna say this as well. We can put a pause on the process. We cannot, we can just keep on with the process. Either way, there is going to be a change in these names, whether this generation does it, this board does it, or the next board after. Let's look at the, what's going on in the country now with the Tennessee Three. We had th two members be suspended off of the Tennessee courts because of their want to put sensible gun laws into their state and they were kicked off and they were reinstated because of the fight of the new generation getting them put back on and that does not show you that this new generation is coming with some more fire and more energy like how the past generation did with the Vietnam War and all that if you don't think that if this generation doesn't do it that the next won't then you need to do your research on what's going on currently because we can sit back and wait now, but at some point these names will be redone. And that's not me just being biased or anything, that is me going by the current events that we see in our country today. So I want us to all work as a community when we do this. These are our schools. We pay the taxes on this. Now, not me, I'm the young man. But we, this should be a decision made by all of us. We shouldn't be bickering and fighting and putting our personal beliefs into this. The future generation is what's going to be walking through these schools. We have to make sure that when these future generations, I don't want no one else to walk through the schools like I did, not knowing 
what the true meaning behind the name of their own school was, not knowing the history of their own, their own city that they live in, but knowing the history that is being taught to us every single year, the same names, the same curriculum. We have to not only invest in the names, but we have to invest into the education behind the names and the history so that we, we are all coming together as a community to be better, not just to reshape our image so that we look good in the public, but so we actually genuinely are working on ourselves and are knowledgeable about the topics going on today. Thank you. Is there any other discussion? The only thing I would like to add is that um, um, that I am in favor of the pause and that um, we need to continue to find names that are reflective of our diverse community, new names for this moving forward. So are we ready for the vote? Any more discussion? So all in favor of putting a pause? Aye. Aye. All opposed? We have one, one opposed, Ms. Morrisonberger. Motion passed. So Ms. Hoover, you're up next. I guess I should repeat myself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, before you have an action item uh, to change the hourly rates uh, that's being driven by the state minimum wage that was changed on July, January 1 of this year. Are there any questions for me? Mr. Johnson, any questions? Ms. Torres. Dr. Craft, Ms. Morris and Perla, Mr. Morris, Ms. McKeever. I'll just make a motion that we approve the recommendation as presented by um, Ms. Hoover. A second. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? Mm. Motion passed. Thank you, Ms. Hoover. All right, our first um, item for discussion, um, we have Ms. Stephanie Carter. She will come before us and give us the KTEC update. Good evening, um, Mr. Chairman, members of the school board, community members, and Dr. Gurley. I'm pleased to be here tonight to present an update on the transition of, of KTEC to the sole ownership of Charlottesville City Schools. So, do I want the slides or Leslie? Here we go. Thank you. Good evening again, everybody. I'm really pleased to be here um, with you tonight to share some of the hard work that's been going on so far as we begin the transition of KTEC to um, Charlottesville City sole, sole ownership. <clears throat> um, I'd like to share with you kind of where, where we are, um, what we've done, what we've accomplished, and, um, and where we 
where we see things going. I think to really get a full picture of, of what the needs are, we're gonna start a bit with trying to help you understand and um, reiterate some of the foundational structures of KTEC. So currently KTEC is, um, KTEC is obviously the regional technical center that serves Albemarle and Charlottesville. We have, 400 and char we have 400 seats available in 10 programs. Um, our current operating budget that includes adult ed is approximately $3.8 million. Our enrollment request, about 25% of the slots are allotted to each high school. Um, that includes um, using the assigned base school, Community Lab, Elk Hill, um, Lugo McGinnis, and Ivy Creek. They register during this time as well. To make sure that we are providing equitable access, we do enrollment um, enrollment windows. So from January 18th, and these dates adjust obviously every year to March 31st, every, each of these base schools has an equal number of seats. Um, once that window closes, the next window that opens allows um, student seats to be open to all schools. So for example, if we have a program that has, has one school's requested more seats at that time, the the 410 to 428 window, we will we'll move those requests into open slots in those programs. And on 5-1, all open seats are remaining to homeschool and out of district students. Um, we, um, Almoral County Schools and Charlottesville City Schools split the capital cost 50-50. The current cost allocation structure has been in place since 1969 when the school opened. It's important to understand that at that time there was one high school um, in Charlottesville and one high school in Albemarle County. The current funding structure is based on a formula created by the founding members of the K-Tech Center Board. So you can, see the, you can see the screenshot there, which is just literally a screenshot from our finance coordinator's um, budget. And you can see that, sorry, I need to be able to. I'm getting kind of old, I can't see as well. Um, so you can see the, the funding calculation there is for the upcoming budget and what we've requested. And the way, that it is, the way that it is determined is that it's based on this formula and we use four year averages with half of the allocation from each school division's percentage of nine through 12 um, ADM or fall membership across all four high schools. Then the other half is based on the division's four-year average of KTEC membership. So it's, it's, um, it's sort of funky. I don't know a better way to say it. It's, it's kind of challenging to understand it, but, um, but it works out and you can kind of see that it is proportional, that, that the percentages are proportional to enrollment. And, but that's how it's structured. Moving forward, slots will be offered to Almoral County Schools under a rolling agreement for periods not less than three years. Um, I'm sure that the board is well aware that most CTE programs are at least two years that, um, for students to be able to get their completer status. If a student finishes year one at KTEC and they remain in good standing, and I always like to say that good standing is, um, it's not an opinion, it's based on the note that students have to have completed at least 80% of their course competency. So I just want to make sure that that's clearly defined. Good standing is not, it's quantifiable. Um, the student is guaranteed a slot for year two if, in the, each division's allocation of slots. Multi-year agreements will ensure no sudden changes that could cause undue um, fiscal or operational stress for all stakeholders. Obviously, we all know budgets are created, um, you know, long in advance, almost a year in advance, starting usually in October of the year before. So a multi-year agreement is necessary in order for um, school division, both school divisions to pl plan accordingly. The initial percentage of slots offered to ACPS will approximate the current slot allocation. This just gives you an example. It's just a quick table to show you what that would look like. And, um, and so in October of 2023, um, we would request slot determination for 2024, 2025, and 2026. And then in October 2024, we would ask for commitment for 2027. And October 25, we would ask for slot determination for 2028. That's how that would work. Moving forward, um, tuition will be a key component of the budget. And, um, and tuition will be calculated based on 
um, the total operating budget excluding all capital expenses, less certain overhead costs such as utility, maintenance, non-instructional personnel, and also programs that are exclusive to a division. KTEC has, um, a, has a class at, that is offered at Western Albemarle High School, which obviously would only be accessible to Western um, Albemarle High School students. So that would not be included in the cost. Um, and, um, and Albemarle County would be, would be invoiced for the, for the cost of that program. And then that number would be divided by the total number of slots. The tuition rate, it will be set on a biennial basis that corresponds with the state's biennial budget process with the Consumer Price Index or CPI applied to year one tuition to determine the rate for year two. The same slot tuition rate will be charged to any school division um, reserving student slots outside of Charlottesville City Schools. For, the, for ACPS, this calculation actually um, results in a lower cost per slot than would have occurred under the current, the continuation of the partnership due to um, the capital and overhead costs being now solely funded by Charlottesville City Schools as the, as the sole owner. So what we've done so far, and I have to say, we've been working hard. We've been, I, I, I have Mr. Gur, uh, Dr. Gurley and I, we are, we're besties almost. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> so what we've accomplished so far is we have created, um, we have planned tra transition teams. Um, we've created a really extensive planning document. We've established a meeting schedule. We've communicated with staff in the community on several occasions in, in coordination with Beth and with Phil um, Jeremita from Almeral County. And we've, we have spent a great deal of time analyzing the current KTEC budget to make sure that we have a solid grasp on what um, funding needs are going to, to project the funding needs moving forward. Short-term plans that are in motion, um, we've been talking, I've been working with Maria, Maria Lewis as well, um, onboarding new staff through Charlottesville City Schools. So we have made an internal decision and, and we're supported by Almeral County that when we onboard new employees for the 2023-24 school year, we will, we will take them through the Charlottesville City Schools process. And the thought behind that is um, as we begin to transition, it will allow us to go through this process and identify any blind spots that we may have. Um, I think we all feel extremely um, strongly that we want to make sure our staff feels really supported and that we're not going to have any missteps around onboarding personnel and making sure all of our folks are well taken care of. Um, we're going to transition to CCS pay tables, move KTEC staff to CCS email, um, conduct initial employment screenings with existing staff, which we have to do for the email piece, and then transition KTEC staff to CCS talent ed. So those are some things that short-term plans that are actually in motion. These are the leadership, these are the transition teams that have been identified. Um, we have a central leadership team that um, is comprised of Dr. Gurley, Kim Powell, Renee Hoover, Marlene Hall, Pat Cuomo, and myself. This team, um, and Mr. Cuomo, we bring on board as, as needed. Um, he's very busy with running technology for the school division. And so we try to make sure that what we're discussing is relevant to him. Um, we're the team that's leading and supporting the overall transition and planning. Um, we brainstorm what, what needs and what things we can kind of chip away at and get started. We meet at least monthly, but I do think it's important to make sure to say that it is at least monthly. We've had, um, we've had a lot of meetings, that, you know, just like knowing that we need to get together. And so we'll call those meetings and, and we gather. We're, there's also a joint leadership team that's comprised of Dr. Gurley, um, Dr. Haas, the Almeral County Superintendent, um, Jamie Gellner, who is their director of special projects, program evaluation and department improvement, and, and myself. We are the team that's supporting transition and communication between the school divisions. So um, we are getting together to talk about what, what needs there are, what holes or gaps there may be, which as we transition that we can identify to make sure that those things can be addressed and not impact the school community. And we meet at least month, we meet monthly. We have a finance team that is comprised of Renee Hoover with, um, and Marlene Hall, who is our KTEC finance coordinator. They are the team, um, and Kim, I should have put that on here, Kim Powell joins as needed as well, and I would join as, as needed as well, um, but we're, they're the team planning the financial transition and budgeting as KTEC comes under the sole ownership and, and 
finance, payroll, human resources, those are really some really, I feel like those are the really heavy lifts that we need to make sure are done really well. Um, and so they meet frequently and as needed. I, I didn't even put the defined frequency because it's, it's been twice a week or once a week um, in the last few weeks. Human resources, um, I get to work again with Maria Lewis, who's an old friend of mine. We worked together a long time ago. And so I'm working with her, Dan Redding from Almiral County Human Resources and myself as we hash out um, what's going on. Maria and I, uh, we meet at least, at least every other week. Um, but again, if we need to meet more, we do. Our instruction team programming is Dr. Odie, um, Megan Fitzgerald and myself, and we meet every other week and plan for instruction and programming. The technology transition is another big component along with human resources and finance that we're beginning to tackle. Um, that team consists of Mr. Cuomo, Priya Wood, who is the Almiral County Senior Infrastructure Systems Engineer, Robert Rejoinus, as, and who is the Assistant Director of Infrastructure and Support Services for Almiral County. Um, I know that Mr. Cuomo successfully applied for E-rate funding for the WAN project to make sure that KTEC was included. And um, they've done a broad assessment of infrastructure at KTEC, but I think a lot of their work will come um, down the road just a little bit. Key components of this transition moving forward, I think it's really key that we are transparent about what we're doing and how we're doing it. Um, with lots of frequent and open communication, not only with the KTech staff, but with the community. Um, and then Sh uh, Charlottesville City uh, focus on workforce development. We are gonna work closely with Charlottesville City government um, and make sure that we are able to incorporate and, and develop, help them develop their vision for how KTech can be leveraged as a, um, as a regional week workforce development center for the community. Uh, to serve both high school, but also adult students. Um, rolling slot commitments, driving future resource allocations, if there is gonna be a focus on that and, that and a need to make sure that that is done well. And then um, as if ACPS needs fewer high school slots in the future, Charlottesville City may shift uh, more day programming to meet adult needs. I think that's it. I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Ms. Carter, for yes. that very extensive update. Are there any questions from board members? Mr. Johnson? Um, not necessarily any questions, but I do have a comment that I would like to add. Um, with KTEC being um, coming to Charleston State Schools only, right? I just want to say that I'm a little upset that you did this on my way out. You know, I would have loved to participate this um, in my early years in school, but um, I'm really excited to see what this program can do for our students. Um, like I said earlier, I really believe that we need to kind of look into how we're educating our students and what opportunities we're giving them. Um, and K-Tech is just one of those opportunities that have taken advantage correctly. And if we are able to use this tool that we have to get our students um, more opportunities so that way they can re-explore the career paths that they want to follow in life, that we're not only going to produce more students that are going to be successful in life, but we're going to allow students to be more happy, um, not only in their day-to-day -day at school, but also when they graduate, they know that they have a pathway to follow um, and they're not lost, you know, when, they, when they're out of high school. They feel like they've gotten experience um, to know what they want to do and how to go forth about it. So I want to thank you and the transition team and everybody's working forward um, to get this program up and running for us and um, making it the best it can be. Um, so I wish you all nothing but the best of luck on that. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jashon. And I have to say to you, I'm very proud of you. I was your principal at Buford and I am, it, it just makes me shine so bright to see a young man like you really, it's very impressive. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any other comments? Okay, thank you, Ms. Gard. Thank you. I, I actually had a question, I'm sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> Um, I don't see Piedmont in my, like, I don't see Piedmont as part of this at all. Is there any discussions like with Piedmont about how this transition? I, I kind of direct that to you, Dr. Yep. Yeah, so we have had several conversations. We, well, I shouldn't say several conversations. We've had several meetings with 
Piedmont. Initially, our conversations with Piedmont have been solely been about the um, adult pieces. So that's why you don't see a lot of that, um, a lot of that here, but they have, we've met with Dr. Runyon um, and Do Dr. Donnelly, I'm John Donnelly. So we've had those conversations, but that a lot of that work has just been reflected mostly in our adult ed, on the adult ed side. And we've got an upcoming meeting with them on April 25th, just to kind of help, especially Dr. Runyon onboarding, um, really helping her dig in and understand our adult program. So then I think we can see where there are opportunities embedded in, in what they're offering and what we can offer and, and how to best serve our community. Yeah. Ms. Torres, do you have a comment? Um, yeah, just wanted to say thank you for, for this update. Um, I'm, I'm excited and I think it's really helpful for everybody to understand and know um, the different task force groups working and, and what they're doing behind the scenes. And I think, you know, we, we've stated that. So it's, it's important to know and you're busy. <laughs> you all are very busy Absolutely. and we appreciate that. And, and we do really prioritize this for not only Charlottesville City Schools, but for all students in the area and the adult ed and just the possibility. So we really appreciate the support of everybody who values this program and change is, you know, a little scary sometimes, but I, I, it's exciting mm -hmm. at the same time. And it, it's going to be what we make it. So we appreciate um, all of the work that's, that's being put into this. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Dr. Crabb. Yeah, I would also like to express um, deep appreciation for your leadership and organizing of all of these pieces and, um, you know, just sort of stepping right into it and uh, making sure that the process and the structure of the changes is continuing in a good way. I think it's, it's, it's new. I will, honestly, it's a little scary, um, you know, looking at this big change. Um, but I guess on the plus side too, I was just thinking about um, all of the opportunities. We have so many, um, you know, ELL students coming in to our division now. And uh, I think that KTEC offers fabulous and fantastic opportunities for um, many of those students to develop skills and to be able to, um, you know, earn a good living and have a career path in the community. So, you know, I think there are some really exciting possibilities ahead along with the scary part. And, um, but, you know, you've just been um, an amazing, um, you've been done an amazing job of steering all this and I uh, appreciate that. it very Thank much. Ms. Mossberg. I would just like to add as someone who has partaken in the culinary, um, um, what do you call it, the, the treats of the culinary classes <laughs> and students, um, that KTEC is very much an asset and that um, this is, it's, you know, a scary transition, but there is so much potential in the change. There's so many students, I think, um, in our surrounding communities that need a different pathway other than college and the outrageous amount of debt that that brings along and you know I just know for a lot of people it's like oh if I can't do college what what do I do and so that was one of the things I was impressed about in, in Charlottesville when I came here was KTEC I was like this is really nice to see thing you know kids having a clear career path a way to just get your foot in the door mm -hmm. somewhere to understand how you know, like seeing yourself outside of high school. And so I do value that. And then just for a moment um, to put my HR hat on, to just say that I know um, as an employee of any, you know, company, division, district school, that transitioning um, to new leadership is, it's, it's scary. Um, but I can honestly say <laughs> from all my years of HR experience that I would gladly board any ship that Dr. Gurley was leading um, at his time <laughs> here. I, he balances caring about the you know, students and their education and the, the teachers and administration, um, their well-being as well. So 
um, if anyone's watching this or, you know, a part of the, the new family coming into the Charlottesville City Schools that um, you couldn't ask for a better um, superintendent and a better leader. So we look forward to you all being a part of the Charlottesville Division. I can also just reiterate that I can, I can support that statement. Um, Dr. Gurley, I, I text him, I, he, he responds, I call him, he picks up. Um, he's been incredibly supportive, responsive to any time I've said, I think we need to do this, or have you thought about this? And um, so I, I completely see, and I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with him. Um, I really have truly enjoyed learning from him and, and being able to be beside him and, and these discussions and this transition. It's been, it's been an honor for me too. Okay, Mr. Morris. Well, um, Ms. Carter, um, I wanna add my, well, she's already spoken. Oh, well, go ahead. No, you go ahead and then I'll conclude. I, I just, thank you, Ms. Carter. Um, I also want to say um, that I'm really excited for what the future holds, and I think this board being is really supportive of KTech and what it's been and what is possibly there and really want the whole community to be part of that discussion as we move forward. So, thanks. Mm -hmm. I just want to add, uh, Ms. Carter, um, this is um, a win-win for our students, both in the city and the county, um, all across the state. Um, Workforce readiness, career readiness is the buzzword um, rather than just everybody going to college. Um, I am excited. Um, we are excited. Um, and um, you steering the ship, what can I say? Thanks for Google. You remember that? <laughs> yes, I do, of course. <laughs> Maria does too. <laughs> yes. So um, it's just a win win. I am just excited. Thank, and thank you. you for your leadership. Thank you. I do want to say May 16th is our signing day. We're probably going to have about 30 KTEC students that are signing with local companies um, to join their, their employment pools. So um, it's a joint board meeting as well. So I hope to see all of you there. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank Chair, you. can I make one, yes. one quick comment? I think um, I, some of this has already been said, so I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, I greatly appreciate you. There's great opportunity for students, Charlottesville City Schools, Almaro County. Um, and I, I just think a slight shift that we can make as a division is to say that quite often we kind of beat around it. Sometimes we say it directly is that not all kids are made for college. The truth is not all kids are made for the trades either. So we have to make that shift to know that this is an important first step for, for people, just as the same it is for college. So it is very equal. So we just need to be careful how we, how we make that, that phrase because it has kind of this unintentional devaluing. Um, so not all kids are made for trades either. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. You all have a nice night. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we will now have Dr. Odie a couple times, uh, but she's gonna come up to us this evening and present the special education annual plan. All right, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Gurley, good evening again. In your packet, you have the anecdotal pieces of the special education annual plan with the data and the numbers. I tonight will take a few moments to provide an overview through this presentation. Next slide, please. Here in Charlottesville City Schools, we do serve students who are identified as having disabilities through individualized services and programs. We want to serve students in their least restrictive environment. We wanna make sure that we are meeting the unique needs of every learner every day. Based on our December 1 count, the total number of students with disabilities in the division is 600. We do have some specialized programs and support models that provide intensive supports. Those are the LEAP program, which is Learning Essential Competencies Adapted Curriculum and Practical Life Skills. 
Uh, we have the best program, Behavior and Emotional Support and Tools, and the STAR program, Structured Teaching and Autism Resource Classroom. We've been collaborating with the Piedmont Regional Education Program, otherwise known as PREP, to provide related services for occupational therapy and physical therapy, as well as vision and autism and behavior support. Next slide, please. Here you see our preliminary plans on how we will utilize our funds for 23-24. Final funds come into school divisions by mid to late summer, and we will update at that time. Fund 611 is our general SPED fund, and Fund 619 is for preschool. The largest amount in both, of course, is seen in personnel services, which is our staff, our wonderful staff, our special education teachers and instructional assistants who serve our students directly in our schools. Purchase services are used to help meet the needs of our students, some who may need interpretation services or other needs that we don't provide in the school setting. Internal services are our school division's indirect costs to manage our grant. These rates change every, every year. The state has not released the FY24 rates as of today, but those rates do range from 4.4% to 5%. And then we have materials and supplies. Uh, and those are the items that our teachers need to support students in the classrooms, including things like assistive technology devices and other items that are specialized for students. Next slide, please. The next two slides capture those data so that you can see them in a pictorial view. Again, as you can see, the majority of our grant funds are allocated to personnel and benefits. Here on this slide, you see section 611. Again, that's our general uh, fund. And then on the next slide, you see section 619, which is the preschool funds. See that large chunk again for personnel and benefits. Next slide, next slide please. In summary, we utilize special grant funding to support students with disabilities here in Charlottesville City Schools. And a portion of that grant is also used to support students with disabilities who are parentally placed in private schools within the city limits. So just a special note, we have not had any parentally placed SPED students in private schools in the last two years. Um, after 18 months of not using those funds that are dedicated specifically to parentally placed SPED students in private schools, the revenue is reallocated and made available for um, Charlottesville City Schools to use for SPED. Next slide. As you can see here, our goal is to provide high quality instruction by supporting and implementing an individualized system of integrated supports and structures to address the academic, social, emotional, and behavioral needs of students with disabilities. And tonight, this is informational only, but we will ask that the board take action at the May board meeting. At this time, I'm happy to answer questions. Mr. Johnson, Louis Torres. Um, I guess I, is there anything else that the special ed department feels like they need from us? I mean, in, in reviewing data um, and, and just how some of those students fall within categories that are, are not faring real well. I mean, what, what can we do or what are we doing to, to better support? I'm not sure there was. So I um, just wondering if we are, are regrouping, recircling wagons as, as you know, we're kind of 
looking at the special ed department and when, as we've looked at the data um, from, from our students with disabilities um, and, and just how we can better support them. Is there anything else we can do? So one thing I will say is we do have our student success meeting. So included that um, our school success meetings that where we go out and we visit schools and review data, that's all that those meetings are consist consist of data for all students. So if there are particular subgroups of students who we recognize are not doing well, aren't, you know, the, the data isn't trending, the data aren't trending up then what we've been doing is deploying supports differently. So we have differentiated our supports based on those needs. So for example, if we recognize that, you know, within this group, there are some students with, um, there are some students with disabilities that aren't performing well, then we've supported those teachers with interventions, whether it be um, differentiating the tier two or tier three interventions, or whether it's providing the teachers with more support in terms of, pedagogy. So, I mean, I do feel like we've been using the data to delineate and differentiate our support for students and for those, um, their respective teachers. And one thing that we did differently this year is we did have a special education coordinator or our supervisor attend those school success meetings. We didn't have that last year. So that was an addition uh, so that we could have eyes uh, from these experts as we're going into classrooms, as we're um, observing instruction and talking to leadership about what those needs are. Thank you. Um, and I guess just looking forward to as we continue to kind of hone our, our strategic plan, you know, as leadership and you all decide and work to, you know, choose some goals that um, we are really looking, I mean, we always look at the data, we always talk about the data um, and it comes up every year. When, when data is released publicly. So I'm hoping that we, you know, are ready to, to take the next step and, and actually make, make that data, you know, make the students, you know, one of our, our goals so that we can see it. So thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Kraft, Ms. Morrison-Berger, Ms. Morrison, Ms. McKeever. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. All right. And we're going to also have Dr. Odie and Dr. Odie with our um, CTE plan. She and Ms. Fitzgerald. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Gurley. Um, board members, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, tonight we will share with you our CTE local plan. We have the wonderful Megan Fitzgerald, who is our CTE instructional specialist here tonight. And I'm going to segue to her to lead this presentation. Good evening, Chairman Bryant, members of the board, and Dr. Gurley. I am Megan Fitzgerald, and I am the CTE Instructional Specialist for Charlottesville City Schools. I am thrilled and honored to present my first ever school board meeting to you all this evening. I am here to present to you the Carl Perkins local plan for the 2023-2024 school year, which is a federal grant used to help fund our career and technical education programs at Buford, Charlottesville High School, and KTech. Before I present to you our budget and our goals for spending, I want to give you a brief overview of our CTE programs. Our CTE programs at Charlottesville City Schools currently offers 16 out of the 17 career clusters that the Virginia Department of Education recognizes. Within these career clusters, we provide opportunities for students to explore over 30 careers pathways. While students are moving through CTE program concentrations or trying out a new pathway, we offer 20 different state recognized industry credentials. At the end of every school year, we identify CTE completers upon successful completion of two CTE sequential courses. In the 2022 cohort, we had 130 CTE completers, which makes up almost half of the graduating class. Next slide. The 2022-2023 enrollment numbers are slightly off because this data was pulled from the fall master schedule collection report. It shows that our CT enrollment numbers are slightly down. Um, these are, there are a few things that contribute to the slight decrease. 
One worth noting is the learning loss due to the pandemic with more students participating in credit recovery classes, flexibility and scheduling is more limited and some students cannot add courses outside of core content areas. We do hope to see an increase next year from adding two additional courses in the plans of study, which is cybersecurity and unmanned aircraft systems. While these numbers represent unduplicated counts, we do have students who enroll in more than one CTE course in a school year. As you can see on the slide, our biggest CTE program areas are engineering, urban farming, computer science, photography, and marketing. Next slide. As mentioned earlier, we offer 20 different industry credentials at CHS and KTEC. The most common one is the workplace readiness assessment, which assesses students on the common core competencies that are embedded in all CTE courses and curriculum. And the 2021-2022 school year, we gave this out to students in grades nine through 12. And we had 198 students who received this credential. In total, we had 435 industry credentials awarded to students with 392 students having more than one. This is great for job acquisition and marketability as students can use these certifications showing they have an understanding of soft and or technical skills needed in the workforce. Next slide. Work-based learning is an integral part of career and technical education. While I can confidently say that this is an area of growth for our program and a goal that has been set for the 2023-2024 school year, we do offer work-based learning opportunities for our students, both at CHS and KTEC. The five listed on the slide are the top work-based learning opportunities we have our students participating in. Next slide. I wanted to share with you our program goals for the upcoming school year because this helps determine our priorities for spending. One, we want to establish career and technical student organizations at the middle and high school. This is, this is an essential component to career and technical education programs since these organizations are co-curricular to what we teach in the classroom. Prioritizing career and technical student organizations will offer our students more leadership experience as they participate in the various organization projects. Our second program goal is to increase recruitment and retention of students who are identified as non-traditional enrollment and special populations enrollment. These two terms are federal definitions that identify students who are either economically disadvantaged, students with disabilities, students who are homeless, English language learners, students in foster care, students who have active military parents, students who are single parents and students who represent a part of underrepresented gender groups. For example, a female in our engineering program would be considered a non-traditional enrollment. Our third and final goal is to increase enrollment in work-based learning opportunities to provide students real world, real, real world experience that reinforces the curriculum that they are learning in their career and technical education courses. These program goals will lead us on the path to establishing a high quality career and technical education program. Next slide. Here is our estimated allocation for the 2023-2024 school year. This number will go up or down depending on set allocations which will be determined and shared in the superintendent's memo by June or July. With this given allocation based off of last year's budget, we wanna prioritize spending in equipment, professional development for CTE teachers and school counselors, and work-based learning initiatives. Typically, we allocate around 60,000 in equipment to keep our programs up to date with industry standards. Programs are on a five to seven cycle, five to seven year cycle with renewing major equipment expenses, which is advised and reviewed by our director of technology, Pat Cuomo. Secondly, we want to prioritize CTE teachers and school counselors opportunities to attend conferences and trainings and their professional organizations to stay current with the best practices, stay updated with curriculum revisions and to receive resources to help them with career and technical student organization implementation. We are allocating around 7,500 to help reimburse conference registration, materials, and travel expenses. Lastly, we want to use these funds to give our students the ability to engage in work-based learning opportunities and initiatives, such as career fairs, industry tours, and other workforce-related field trips for our students to learn, explore, and build awareness about careers. We are allocating around 12,000 to support these initiatives, which will cover the cost of transportation, registration fees, and vendor meals for career fairs with, and other upper, uh, community events to help support workforce development needs and our, of our students. 
This concludes my presentation. We are asking the board to take action tonight as the CTE local plan is due to the state on April 28th. With that being stated, I am happy to answer any questions that you may have at this time. I move the approval of the I move the approval of the career and technical education plan as recommended by the superintendent. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? I, or do we I have any discussion you, awesome, Mr. Johnson? <laughs> do you have any questions or comments? Yes. So um, I would like to take the time now to um, give Ms. Uh, oh, it's not on. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Um, to give Ms. Fitzgerald um, her flowers um, because <laughs> as a student within the building, um, she has got to be one of the most hardworking um, staff members um, I see every day. Um, not only is she doing this position, but she's also teaching classes as well and working with our AVID students. So not only is she doing this because she wants to, I mean, um, she's not doing this because she wants to just elevate her profile or to look nice on any records. She's doing it because <laughs> she's passionate about it. And she really cares about um, her students and building connections and um, getting them to succeed in the workforce um, later on in their lives. So um, I know you work extremely hard every day um, with the amount of meetings you're in and balancing <laughs> your classes and everything. And so um, I just wanted to let you know that I appreciate you and what you do from our students. And I know the board and all of us do as well. So thank you. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Torres. I don't know if I can outdo that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, thank you for the presentation and um, you did a great job. Thank so you. appreciate you being here. And, and I have a friend who, who, is, who teaches here and um, I, I don't know that I've ever met you face to face, but I've, all I've ever heard from this other teacher is wonderful things about you. So there <laughs> thank you go. You. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Crabb. Wow. Well, <laughs> um, I, uh, uh, I appreciate the presentation, and I, I wondered if you could just give us a few examples of some of the work-based learning um, that our students are engaged in, internships, externships, um, that kind of thing, just some examples. So our biggest one is service learning, which is primarily ran through the AVID program. And as you know, that AVID and CTE are combined. Um, so those students are getting the work-based learning credit through the CTE courses. Um, so we have a huge AVID 10 um, service learning project that's happening next week. Um, we also have our Teachers for Tomorrow program that's run as an externship. So they meet the 40-hour requirement to get the externship credit. I know KTEC is doing a lot of apprenticeships and internships through their programs, which is amazing. Um, but I would love to see more internships and externships happening with our capstone courses, such as engineering and photography. And so that is a goal that we are setting for next year. Great. Um, thank you. Ms. Morrisonburg. I just wanted to add that um, you did great on your first presentation. You. And on a lighter <laughs> note, I've only said this to Dr. Odie previously, but you um, will share the award with her now that you have a very calming presence and calming voice. So oh. it was a great presentation. So thank We'll be you. on Audible so that we can read books out loud next. Audible That'll be our next head job. Space. I'm there for you guys. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Mr. Morris. I'll just say, Thank you for um, putting the priorities of equipment, professional development, um, the professional development specifically for school counselors. I think in a line with our conversation about uh, KTEC, like that's the opportunity right there. There are so many uh, members in our, our school population that can be enhanced by going to KTEC with the proper school counseling um, or additional information and additional understanding of what trades are available, uh, traditional trades and newer trades that are coming on board now. And then work-based learning opportunities this board has been discussing, making sure that we have a pathway for all kids um, right after high school. Like this is what we need in the school. Enhancing this and putting money, money towards this is what allows us to have that result of every single student having a pathway. Thank you. Ms. McKeever. And Ms. Fitzgerald, again, thank you for the wonderful presentation. And there, I know what I'm, I haven't said my comments. <laughs> I do have a say. Um, and um, a lot of teachers are saying your praises. So thank you so much. 
Now, I think Ms. McKeever has uh, made the motion. Mr. Morris has seconded. So all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion passed. Thank you, Ms. Fitzgerald. Thank you. And I want to extend the invitation that we have our CHS career fair on Wednesday, April 26th from 1250 to 220 during BKT time. We have over 65 vendors. Um, 15 career clusters are being represented at this career fair, and they are offering summer internships or employment um, or just being there for career awareness. This is open for our juniors and seniors. And so I wish to extend the invitation for you all to be there and to um, um, just see the fun. So thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Miss Fitzgerald. She's one of the, my first little sprinkles of magic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you. Uh, next, we will have uh, Kim Powell with our middle school construction update. If ever there was some good news, <laughs> this is it. Yes. Good evening, Chairman Bryant, and members of the board, and Dr. Gurley. This is a good update tonight. Um, so Leslie, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. When we talked last month, we were actually um, looking ahead to most of these milestones. The bids had been uh, received, but um, the Community Budget Forum and the City Council CIP uh, work session, all of those things were before us. And now all of those milestones have been uh, passed and with uh, really great outcomes for the future of Charlottesville City Schools. Next slide. This is an excerpt from the materials that were, that were recovered or presented by city staff at the CIP work session that was held on March 30th. And what you see here, um, and this is all public information prior to that work session, these are the, this is basically the bid uh, results for um, the low bidder on the project, which was Nielsen Construction. That's also been reported now as well. And you can see there the base bid and then going over to the right, option four sort of represents the all in, if you will. That's with the base bid and the four ad alternates. And I would um, say that it was really um, the MDO and the city facilities development team did a really, really strong work in structuring how the, this project went out to bid in the face of the inflation that we are still in the midst of, just to make sure that there were enough options to bring to bear if needed to make sure that we, we keep moving forward because the, prog the, the process to get here has been, as you well know, uh, a long time coming and a lot of hard work by a lot of folks. So um, we're gonna refer back to option four here in a moment, but what you'll see there is that that option all in um, has a total estimated project cost of nine, 91 million, almost $92 million. So um, next slide, please. So now we celebrate and we just need to take a moment. Um, we were feeling good heading into those milestone dates because we've had such strong collaboration throughout this process with the city, both the elected officials and city council and city staff. And so first and foremost, I would certainly like to thank my colleagues at the city um, budget office for just um, truly working so hard alongside us to identify every creative thing we could come up with to bring funding sources to bear on this project. So big, big thank you there. Um, again, all of our elected um, officials and the staff members who've just kept this project moving forward despite a pandemic. And I just want that to settle in for just a moment. Um, despite all the other things we dealt with, no one lost sight of this, no one let it drop. And we, and we just kept moving as best we could through the circumstances. Um, the community, the community members, Charlottesville United um, and everyone else. And I, you know, this is one of the things, you know who you are, right? I, I can't, won't possibly name names, but there are so many people who have steadily advocated for this important project to keep moving. Thank you. Uh, VMDO for being tremendous partners in this work to date. Um, I know it's very personal for a lot of them because they live in this community um, and they, they represent some of our parents, um, but they've done a great job of keeping everyone well informed and advising us throughout the process. And then this is certainly last but not least, City Council ultimately had to make the decision to authorize contract negotiations to proceed. And they did so uh, with giving direction to facilities development to proceed 
with con with a contract structured around including all four ad alternates at this time. Um, with that, we are also uh, very appreciative of their support in um, applying for the School Construction Assistance Program, otherwise known as SCAP. Uh, we got our grant application in and um, our own preliminary scoring against the criteria. I mean, it would appear that it should be that application should be received favorably. However, we don't know what we're up against with the scoring. So um, we will hopefully know the results of that effort in June. So just a huge thank you. Teamwork really does make the dream work. Um, so Leslie, next slide. This is that um, gra uh, graphic that VMDO provided for us that we've all been kind of using. It's sort of that mall map of you are here in the process of things. And the green arrow, if you look back to last month and compare it, we've moved from the yellow star to the edge of that blue rectangle. We are truly on the eve of construction and that is really, really exciting. Uh, it is the eve of what will be a three-year process, three -year, a three-year occupied construction process. So everyone needs to remember the gain is really worth the pain. A lot of good people are gonna be working together to make sure this goes as smoothly as possible. And, it, and it's gonna be exciting. Um, you will see dirt moving starting soon. Next slide. And that's what I want to talk about now, looking ahead, what to expect. The city contract uh, ne negotiation with the contractor, Nielsen, is underway now. And that process in, in, entails things like really fleshing out the schedule and, and agreeing, making agreements around that. And, and it's truly a, a devil's in the details kind of moment in time. But again, we have great people working on that. And Mike Goddard and his um, support team within the city, I mean, they're nose down in this process right now. Um, Construction activity should begin in June. And what you'll see first is what we affectionately call the bowl area. So if you're in the bus loop at Buford and you're like kind of looking down toward the gym, um, that's the first area to go into construction. So you'll see orange construction fence going up along that sidewalk along the bus loop. And um, with that marks uh, our first significant change, which is the, which has never made sense, I know, but the down the steps main entrance by the office will not be the main entrance for um, our students and families like for summer programming or for next fall. The main entrance moves to where your average uh, stranger would have thought it was all along, right on the top level there uh, as shown in the photo. So we're gonna take the visitor buzzer intercom system, relocate that up top and uh, Julia's done a great job of uh, working with vendors to procure sort of a, a cubicle enclosed yet has some glass windows. It's gonna be like an office sort of greeting office that's right up top when you come in those doors right on the wall there to the left. And so we're working with the Buford team and uh, to determine the staffing for that and, and make sure we have all the appropriate things there. Um, but it'll be a location that can have two people sitting there um, and yet have visibility, visibility yet separation from all the student traffic that's gonna be going on around that space and a storage container. Julia's also uh, rented that for the health and PE equipment because the health and PE team at Buford will um, be uh, very creative. They're excited for the challenge of how to do um, health and PE activities with the students when there is no gym and also limited or actually there will be no access to the green field behind the gym because that, again, that is the first area that goes into construction. Um, so, there will be regular school board updates, of course, for you all in the public, and those will include not only updates about progress, but also photos, and uh, we're certainly looking forward to bringing that information forward to you all regularly. I certainly don't want this to be the last slide for looking ahead because it's a picture of what we have now. I'm really glad that we have uh, Wick Knox here with us again from VMDO. He has um, better imagery to discuss the looking ahead, so I'm going to turn it over to Wick now. Is it okay if I oh, ask no, a no, question? I'll be still, I'll still okay, be here for that's questions, fine. but would you like him to go? Okay. He may answer some of the questions, I don't know, as he's talking about the looking at <laughs> Thanks, Kim. Um, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So this is a aerial image of what we have now at the Buford campus. Um, and I'm actually gonna ask you to switch back and forth between these two a couple of times. Um, and this is, what, this is what we're about to have. Um, so this is an incredibly exciting moment. Um, couldn't be more thankful for the city council and their um, agreeing to, you know, get this done, figure out a way to get it done in the face of everything we've been through. Um, so we will be starting construction 
immediately after the last day of class of this of this year of 2023. So if you yeah if you back up a little bit, there we go. So the gym, which is Building C, is that square building that's on the right side. That will be the first thing that gets demolished. Um, and then moving to the left um, from that square, you can see that's the bowl that, that Ms. Powell talked about. And that's where we'll start construction. So we'll start, we'll basically build out towards that bowl and we'll build out to the, to the south towards the garden as we start building, this, building the school. Um, one thing that I think it's important for public officials to know is that you, you notice there's a couple of mature trees in that bowl. They are being cut down. Nobody likes to cut a tree down. We are, um, we did put a provision in the contract to have the wood milled and we're gonna reuse it inside the school. Um, but there are, there are some trees that are coming down to, to make the project work. Um, the other thing that you can see, um, if you look to the kind of top right from that square gym building is the garden. Uh, the garden is being relocated um, to a temporary position. Um, on the far left side of the slide, you can see the auditorium building and it'll go um, between the parking lot and the auditorium building and be in place. The, 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 the only bad news of the good news, and we have um, talk to Charles, um, cultivate Charlottesville about this is because we, since we are getting the auditorium building, um, that renovation and expansion will take place where the interim garden is. So the last year of the three years of construction, there will not be a garden at all um, at the um, at the school. And I'm I'm excited to say that's the case because it means we get we get the full project. Um, let's move forward. Um, so let's go ahead one more. So this will be the eventual new entry. So uh, what Ms. Powell was telling you about, the front door will move up to um, the bus loop and then eventually that will get completely walled off as we expand the school a little bit. Um, and our new entry um, will face towards field. Um, and this is what the new front door of the school will look, look like. And that, but that loop becomes a parent drop off and we have a bus loop that goes down to the lower part of the site that will be the bus drop off. Next. This is an updated rendering from the inside. This is kind of a uh, student commons area. Once you come inside the building, um, one of the things that the challenges that we had of course is that building A that we're keeping and renovating is a big blocky building and it's really hard to get daylight into the, into the middle of it. And so we have this large skylight right where we put the addition to flood this entire space with light and both on this entry level and the level below, which is the cafeteria level, is gonna be a common space for, for students. Um, one, of the one of the comments that struck me a lot when we were talking to students when we started this is they said, they said the cafeteria is too big and it's too small. It's, it's too big for lunch and it's too small to have an all school gathering. And we need spaces that we can be in that are ours um, of different sizes. And this is gonna be one of those, those spaces that I think is gonna get a lot of ownership um, by, the, by the students at Buford. Um, next slide. There's, there are numerous outdoor spaces. Uh, there's the, the, when you come off the cafeteria, there's gonna be an outdoor classroom. That was one of the things that was an option not to fund. That's gonna be wonderful. It'll have, um, it'll be fully accessible down to the lower lawn area. Um, at the top, if you kind of go up the stairs in this image up to the left, um, there's a second terrace up, um, which is off all of the art rooms, um, art and, and, and project rooms, STEM rooms. Um, and that will have access to that lower level of the bowl. So I think there's gonna be a lot more use of that space once we design, um, get the building constructed. And then what you're seeing here on the screen is the fitness terrace. All of those uh, rooms that open up to it are fitness rooms, uh, which is in addition to the full size gym. So a lot of great spaces uh, for inside and outside learning. And then finally, I, I thought I was gonna eventually have to talk about this um, because maybe we weren't going to get the auditorium and I don't really have to. This is the existing building. Um, and if you go to the next slide, you can see this is what 
it's changing into. And then go to one more because I have them side by side. So I'm glad that we're not having to talk about this, that the council has funded it. The first big thing you'll notice on the bottom of the image on the right, the new work, is that we're connecting the buildings. So that was one of the big goals of the project when you put the RFP out in 2019 was to not have students have to go outside to change classes, to have a secure connected campus. So we will connect over between building A and building B with interior space. Uh, we then expand the lobby. Um, the, the house of the auditorium uh, stays pr pretty much like it is, but the expansion allows us to expand the stage. And you can see there's a movable partition. So we have a drama classroom behind the stage, or we can move that partition out of the way and expand the stage and get a grade level on the stage or get a much bigger group on the stage. And then in addition to that, there are four full-size music rooms and a choral room um, that will be in there and with fully renovated bathrooms and ADA accessibility and all those things that you get when you renovate a space. So again, thank you, City Council. Um, thank you, School Board, um, for getting us here. Uh, we, this couldn't be more exciting. I can't wait till we start talking about a groundbreaking ceremony and putting some shovels in the dirt. So at this point, are there any questions? I have some questions. Go ahead, Ms. McKee. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, so I have a um, seventh, sixth grader and a fourth grader. <laughs> so, but I also have, you know, two graduates. So it's just been an interesting journey. Um, so they, the question that I have is related to the PE space. Like everybody I talk to, because my child is taking early morning PE, you know, we have to go to Johnson, it's fine, whatever. But my, they, everybody then says, well, what's happening during the day? And I, I literally have no idea what the answer is to that. I just assume that the Boys and Girls Club are letting us help, are helping us out. <laughs> so there is use of the Boys and Girls Club gym that we were discussing. And there's also just talk about, um, and I think there's some club activities that already do that, but just walking to the park that's um, behind the, the school there and, and doing act, outdoor activities whenever the, um, the weather allows for that. When the weather doesn't allow for that, it could depend on the time of day and the availability of the cafeteria space. So um, there's not a, I don't have a, com a comprehensive answer other than to say we've made provisions to store all of their like equipment. And it's, all, I would liken it to back in the days when we, remember we shared art teachers and we had art on a cart and that's not ideal, right? The art teachers at the elementary schools would go around sometimes and do what we call art on a cart. Well, I guess I don't want to call this PE on a cart, but it is, um, it sort of feels like a version of that where you're, you know, we don't have the ideal space and the boys and girls club gym is not large enough to host a lot of our sections. So there'll, there'll be some, you know, a lot of creativity required, um, but we're making sure that the health and PE team has an organized place to access, you know, balls, flags, whatever types of, you know, PE equipment they want to use as they're planning for the games and activities and things that they'll do with staff. There could be more use of, you know, parking lot area that we block off during certain parts of the day. Um, but I think the green space at the um, park, the Forces Park would probably be one of the primary spaces they go to when weather well, permits. And part of that, you get the walk to and from the park. Um, but I don't want to speak for the health and PE department. All I can tell you is they know it's coming. <laughs> They've known for a while and, and they're, we're, we're working, you know, we're trying to support them in any way we can and they're planning for, um, for this time of transition. Okay, so um, you got to talk to parents. Please communicate well, with the parents about this because honestly, this is like mm -hmm. the early morning, the late, you know, communicate with parents, please. Sure, sure. I, I don't, as a rising, as a parent mm -hmm. of a rising seventh grader, like I have no idea what's happening except for the fact that he's taking early morning PE. Now that we know the project is moving forward, there is so much communication work that has to be done with parents and also with the staff. Um, the health and PE team, we had a member of the health and uh, PE staff and I'm blanking on the name of the gentleman who served on the, he was you know one of the folks who worked with us through some of the planning phases of this. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of more communication that has to happen now that we know this is real. Um, and that includes with our staff, because like the health and PE team, there are going to be times when STEM is impacted. There are going to be different impacts at different times throughout this process. And so you're absolutely correct. Communications with our staff and with our families, uh, it's going to be 
ongoing and certainly the monthly board update is not sufficient. That's about project process, project progress. Those operational type of updates are gonna not necessarily be the headline at these meetings. It's gonna be more through the parent, typical communication, you know, parent communication channels that you would expect. I, I really implore you to create a committee. I mean, you, I just don't, I, I feel like the committee work that we did as um, planning this project needs to now have a parent faculty committee so that everybody can kind of understand. And I don't think that, and again, this is just about process, but I think that people don't, you don't always anticipate the fears and concerns that parents have. Mm -hmm. um, and like everybody's on board, I'm on board, couldn't, couldn't be more on board. Right. Deeply worried, deeply worried about mm -hmm. this transition of my you know, ch youngest children into this. So if I'm worried, know everything, completely supportive of this project, I cannot imagine how worried other parents might be. So I just encourage you to find a way to communicate with parents um, that allows for the concerns to be brought forward. Um, and it's just, I, I, I just, that's the only way we're gonna make this successful is we're gonna continue to have bumps and, 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 and parents who are still gonna be committed to it. Um, and, I, and not that it's the only way it's gonna be successful, it's going to be successful in the long run, but this transition is and always has been the most disconcerting part for um, people. And we still haven't really answered those questions yet. Occupied construction is, is, is not easy. It's not, you know, greenfield construction that's not occupied is certainly preferred, but um, we will thank, thank you for, you know, sharing that. And I, I know that we, we know, and I say, not, it's not just I, Beth Chuck, the MDO, we're, all, we're talking about these things and how we're gonna make those um, communications happen as we go through this process, because that is really important. Like it can't be a surprise to the students, the staff or the families when there's a change in traffic patterns or you know, knowing where and how certain things like PE that we know is gonna be displaced. How is that gonna be handled? Your, and again, I don't, I don't really want shared. you guys dealing with that, period. Like I think it's a building level issue, communication issue with parents mm -hmm. and between the staff. Like I think this is, I mean, mm -hmm. I don't know how much this is VMDO's job, but I do think this is a building level communication concern. Well, I do think that they'll need our support. I mean, there's right. a lot of moving pieces, uh, right. you know, particularly with the building being occupied. So I think there are, there's a lot of logistical support that'll need to happen on our end. The way this transpires is there's the, there's the group that's managing the project and embedded in that group has to be a certain level and my office will probably will play a key role in this. There has to be that connection between, okay, hearing what's going on with the project plan and how schedules are shifting and all that and saying, okay, how, do this tra how does this translate to or impact the operational needs of the school? And then that, that in that role, then you then have to go, okay, schools, this is happening because you can't expect, and I can assure you that Buford staff will not be in all those project meetings like the principal and they just don't, there's not the bandwidth nor is that typically their role. Um, they may be at certain meetings, certainly they could be invited to, but like there's a, there's a whole drumbeat and process that goes with this. There's a lot of project meetings weekly, in fact, and I won't speak for Mike Goddard and the team that's leading that piece of it, but I, I do know from experience that there has to be um, operational representation embedded into that very heavily in order to be hearing what's happening because also the best laid plans get changed with construction and then you've got to adjust. And then all of that requires, to your point, a ton of communication, starting with the staff in the building and then using those channels to communicate with the families, with the staff. Um, it, it's a lot of communication. It's one of the things that, to your point as well, if that's not handled correctly, it can make something that's otherwise a super great thing for this community. Um, you know, more painful or, or not stay in the, the glow that we want it to, uh, because this is so important, as you all well know, uh, we want to do it right throughout, but it's a big process ahead of us, for sure. I just remember telling all the parents, like, don't worry, we'll figure it out, it'll be part of the process, you know, is that we will figure out the occupied construction stuff, so I just right. don't, like, with two months to go until groundbreaking and summer school coming, it's, there's nothing. 
and as you know, the very little from from a parent's perspective, which. So we need to move past the celebrating and start communi communicating. <laughs> Again, lots Got it. to be celebrating. <laughs> I hear you. That's been great. Thank you so much for everybody, everything. But we didn't, we didn't know we had a project. I, <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> I'm, I, you know, I'm always on to the next thing. So I apologize, but I'll keep it up. No, and no, I good, just very can't good points. It enough. <laughs> no, it's all true. Very true, and that is a, one of our big challenges ahead. Thank you. Sure. Mr. Morris. I guess I'm curious a little bit about the flexibility of uh, the gardening and urban farming classes, since it, we won't be having a garden at the school or on school grounds. Um, Kimmy, I think you actually mentioned it for PE, the opportunity to go to Forest Hill. I don't know if we can work with Charlottesville Parks and Rec to do a temporary garden there, or if Cultivate's interested in that. I don't know that. Uh, so I've been in touch with Richard Morse at, over at um, Cultivate with you. We've been communicating with him as well um, because we know how valuable that program is. Um, it's, nothing has changed as far as like, so we have the interim garden space that's still going to be intact until projected year, until, the year, until year three. So um, now that, again, we've only recently known for sure that we're we're going to have that impact. We'll, we'll need to talk. Those conversations, to your point, need to happen um, about what that year looks like. Um, but the reality is the, the green space is just not going to be available. But we, we need to just take a fresh look at that and see what could be possible now that we know that that space, that the interim space is going to be in play in that year. You're, you're correct. And then the last question I have is about the, the trees being milled. Are those being milled by a local company or a local group? Um, it, it's, it's part of the scope of the contract. Okay. So I don't know who they have subcontracted. They may not, not know. Okay. Who they have All right. And the reason I asked that is because I know that there's a group at UVA, UVA Sawmill, um, that's been working with, uh, I think, the local tree commission and another group in Charlottesville. That's all that I have. Thank you. Ms. Morsenberger. Uh, I just want to thank everyone for all the hard work and uh, looking forward to what's to come. So thank you. Dr. Craig. Uh, um, I want to celebrate the moment. And I know we have, there's a lot of these pieces that need to be put in place, uh, you know, to communicate with our parents and families. But um, just the fact that our whole community has risen up to do this. Um, you know, Charlottesville isn't always an easy community, you know, and we wrestle with everything, but um, it's just, I think, a really significant moment that the whole community has come together and risen up to approve this project and to do it right and to do the whole thing the way it needs to be done. Um, and I'm so excited for uh, all of the opportunities for our middle school students, you know, that um, this new environment will allow. I think it's just going to be such a game changer. Um, so I am happy. And thank you. Stories. I want to um, reiterate just some of the gratitude to, to Wick and his team, you know, way back as far as just how you organize the subgroups and pushing out into the community and engaging community and hearing voices, yes, that continue to show up, but also hearing and listening to voices who maybe only showed up for one or two meetings and those voices mattered. And so that was just such a, a great um, experience for me to see that and to watch it and to be part of it and to hear that. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I think um, acknowledging um, Ms. McKeever's, you know, very real concerns as a parent, but with her board hat on and, and knowing all of that. But I mean, I remember, you know, when we were talking about options of having to, I mean, one of the options was um, relocating students, you know, and just the process of, of where we got where we're at and we really have the best of what we could have hoped for. And then fast forwarding to the last, to the conversations with council, you know, through the last couple of years and, and the work that we've all done and the conversations that we've all had to um, 
paint the picture with your help and with your renderings and your team's renderings of what this would do and bringing in experts and um, Nancy Deutsch and, and all of these about the impact it would have for our students. Um, and then getting down to the wire in the last few weeks and these conversations that council had and when you all brought and when Mike Goddard brought um, the add-ons, you know, and just talking about whether council, you know, would, would consider funding the full project and, and what not having a certain add-on might mean to our students. Um, not being able to connect that new auditorium, there we have, you know, everybody prioritized wanting to have a closed campus and the safety and what that meant. Um, accessibility and a lot of those add-ons, if we didn't do a couple of those things, some people wouldn't be able to access you know, that, that out yard space. Some people and parents would be limited in their access to the new auditorium and, and those things. Anyway, it was just really exciting to listen to the conversation and to listen to council kind of work through this and to hear them embrace and ultimately um, commit to publicly, you know, the whole thing and wanting to do the auditorium. So very, very exciting, um, all of the work and, and um, I don't know, this is, this is good, but yes, we do have to take care of, you know, the parents and I, I know that we will do that. So thank you. Mr. Johnson. Um, I would just like to say, I was amazed by the pictures I saw. This was my first time seeing these pictures. So um, it, it's real to me, uh, surreal to me because um, this project started, um, well not started, but I knew, I remember it getting underway um, my first term back in 2020. So to see it finally in motion, seeing the pictures and seeing the vision, um, you know, it's, it's nice to hear, but when you get to see it and envision it and, and hear that the plan is in motion, it, it's really surreal. Um, and as a former student, um, as uh, Ms. Carter had said, when I was over at Buford um, seventh grade year, um, as a former Buford student, um, it, <laughs> it, it's, it's good to see the improvement in it. You know, uh, the building when I was there, um, you know, I'm very grateful for being able to go to school there. But, you know, we, I think we all know as a board and um, just as people who work in the city school system that Buford needed the, uh, the renovation. And um, I think a few other schools needed, but we knew that Buford being our one middle school here, um, hosting a lot of our kids, we know that um, Buford really needed this. And um, so as a student, um, I'm very grateful that the students coming up um, will be able to go to school in a building that not only is you feel the uh, environment of the teachers that we have here, but the environment and the new renovations that show that our, our board and our um, staff members really care about the students and, and what they have inside the building. And, you know, the environment matters, you know, and when you're trying to learn, when, you know, when you have a new renovated building with new renovated bathrooms and renovated classrooms and, um, you know, you don't get that sense of, you know, negativity in the room, you know, you, you're getting that brand new fresh feeling. And so that, that's really important. So I'm really glad that we're, we're getting that for our new kids. And I think the next three years or so, um, and to address the communication as well. Um, yes. Communication is one of those things where it's, it's really difficult, especially on projects like this. And um, I am, and fully understanding that you guys just found this out 48 hours ago. So um, this here shows me, you know, you guys come in here 48 hours later and giving this type of presentation with this type of vision and, and images shows me that you guys have the right mindset and how to communicate. Um, and I have fully, I have all the trust in the world that um, you guys and the rest of the staff working on this will um, put full effort to communicate this to uh, students and families. Um, and I will say this, I really um, hope that moving forward to our next meeting next month that we get to see uh, more members um, that you guys are working with so that maybe possibly we can hear their side of things. Um, so that way if we do have questions revolving around specific sectors that maybe we may not be able to answer or if we just want more information from um, specific sectors of this project, we get to hear that firsthand from them. So I don't know what representatives may be able to come from um, anybody. So um, I'm really glad you brought that up. One of the things we would like to ask is that if you have questions that you'd like included in the project update that you would send those in advance of the meeting because to be respectful of Mike Goddard's time 
and Mr. Knox time, even though I know he's been so gracious to attend so many meetings with us through this process. Um, to your point, it would be really helpful also for that matter, Mr. Jordan and his staff, um, you know, if, if there's some, if there's an area you want to delve into that we haven't already pushed out communications on, please send those questions in advance. We'll be sure to be prepared. Thank you. Um, and if I could just ask, um, I just had three small questions as well. Um, one regarding, um, so due to um, our PE center being um, kind of in um, disarray here, we're trying to figure out what that's going to look like. Um, my one question about that is, um, I'm not too sure. I think I remember back in middle school that this was a few years ago. Um, <laughs> Uh, with fitness testing, uh, would that bother fitness testing? Do we know how we would uh, monitor that and how we would do anything That's like that? That's a great question. We'll put that into the list of things to see what our PE team at Buford has already thought about that because I'm sure they know what those annual milestones are, those things that are routine in their program. So that's that's a great one. I even remember those tests from when I was in school. So that tells you something a little <laughs> scary. But anyway, um, thank you. Yeah, good question. What others do you... Um, and I'll just ask one more. So um, going with Don Morse about uh, the uh, trees. Um, so um, as we are, you know, rooting those up and, um, you know, to create more space, do we know if we're going to then um, plant more trees to, um, you know, around the area or if we can find specific areas to, uh, so we're not losing, you know, that, um, you know, we're tearing down a lot of trees. So uh, not just in this project, I mean, like just in general. So is there any way that we could either, if we haven't thought about it already, that we could possibly think about, um, since we're tearing down trees, um, putting them back somewhere else or growing even more trees um, in the future after this project? There's, a, there's gonna be a bunch of new trees planted um, for the project and it will be a net gain. I don't know the, what the total number is, but there will be more trees when we finish than when we started. But, and I think things like that are good to hear um, because, you know, not only does it, is it good to hear about this project, but then when you hear small things like that, that just show you that it's improving more things than one, it, it's, it's, you know, it's really heartwarming. So um, I give big thanks to you and the rest of your team and everybody that's working on this project. Like I said, it's very surreal, not only as a student who went to the school just two, three years ago, but also just as someone who really cares about, you know, I have a little brother who's currently there. Um, and I have family that, you know, so, and friends. So this is really surreal to see and seeing the progress from two years ago, two, three years ago to now is um, I'm extremely proud of this division and the work that we're putting forth. So um, I can't wait. I will be gone in August, but I will definitely be checking in to see, you know, kind of how this project is shaping up. I'll be sure to email one of you all to see how this is going in the future. So really proud and really thankful for you all. Okay, thank you. Um, just a few words, um, Wick and to Wick and team, thank you so much for laying out the vision. Kim, you kept us updated throughout this whole process and you continue to keep us updated. I want to thank the community members and parents for rallying the troops to ensure that this project came to fruition. This is a great day. I am so very happy and excited for our students, for those students who will go in that building in a few years. This is a great day for Charlottesville City Schools and our students. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry. Next, we'll have Dr. Odie with the um, caliber update. All right, I think this is my last time up here. Good evening again, um, Mr. Chairman, um, board members, Dr. Gurley. At this time, I'll come to you with a calendar update regarding the development of a 2024-25 school calendar. Next slide. Tonight, we will talk about the planning process. I will share a draft calendar with you, a 24-25 draft calendar and survey results with you. Next slide. As you may recall, during the development of the 23-24 school calendar, 
we learned that there indeed was an interest from our community for starting the school year earlier than we have traditionally started and ending in May rather than in June. What we heard loud and clear from our stakeholders was that they indeed needed more time to prepare for a calendar such as this. The board asked that we work with the calendar committee to have more community outreach for input, to check in with childcare facilities about how this change would impact families with children needing childcare, to develop a draft calendar and to explain the why regarding the change in the start date and the end date. Some of those reasons why include, it is a change, um, it is what many of our surrounding counties are doing, or we would be completing the school year in May. Uh, we'd be placing more instructional time before those SOL assessments. When we do that, uh, we would have less time after SOL assessments, which would be a positive as we tend to have more absenteeism and behavioral issues after SOL assessments. The calendar committee met on various occasions between January and the end of March. They developed the why for the change and worked to develop a draft calendar. Once the calendar draft was developed, we well, and while it was being developed, we worked with the communications department to create a survey and to share the draft calendar and survey with our stakeholders. We asked our family engagement coordinator, Bianca Johnson, to reach out to various childcare facilities to ensure that they would be able to pivot and provide childcare if we adjusted our calendar. And the answer was yes. I also even spoke with our activities director, Andy Jones, to ensure that a change such as this in the calendar would not negatively impact athletics, and he assured me that it would not. These are some questions that had come up as we started this conversation. And so we asked principals to share about the new calendar in school meetings, during weekly blasts, and newsletters, however they could, so that the communication was clear and consistent. Next slide, please. This draft calendar is where we have landed. I'll point out some, some key points. The school year starts on August 14th, which is a week earlier than where we have traditionally started. And it ends on May 30th, before we even enter June. We are continuing with the three days off at Thanksgiving, as there was mixed opinion about this. We are ending the second, now this is a big one here, a big change, a, a nice positive change. We are ending the second nine weeks, the Friday before winter break, which is like a natural break there. And we're maintaining the full two weeks of winter break, a big request uh, to keep that in place. And we have the Monday, January 6th as a teacher work day to work on report cards so that our faculty won't feel pressure to complete record, report cards during winter break. We have four professional learning days and this calendar has 178 days, but an approximate 1,026 instructional hours. Next slide. The survey was opened on March 12th, and we had 472 participants as of April 2nd. I looked today, there were 475. We hadn't closed it. So we only got three more over these last couple of weeks. We made sure that we included the why in the survey narrative, just as another reminder of the purpose of moving the start time earlier. And we basically had two questions. Do you support this calendar? And 
what comments do you have? A zero indicated that they were strongly opposed to the calendar, while a five indicated that they strongly supported the new calendar. Next slide. You see here the results of our survey. As you can tell by the shape of the graph, the large majority are in favor of moving towards the early start. Again, the five indicates the strong support of the calendar. Four indicates that they support it. And three indicates a neutral response. Some trends that we saw in the comments included uh, that some participants still wanted the full week of Thanksgiving. I think that that's gonna be a mixed bag no matter what, um, but because uh, others were so thankful that we were not having the full week. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, several said that they loved the new calendar. Several were grateful for the advanced notice. Of course, there were some who were not in favor, but we fully understand that you're not gonna make everybody happy. We do have the majority in favor. We are pleased with the number of participants, the number of responses, considering this is not the normal time that we, the normal time of year that we're doing calendar work. Uh, so we were pretty pleased to get almost 500 responses. Next slide. So that concludes my presentation. This calendar is for information only this month, but we certainly hope that the board will be able to take action in May so that our families can have plenty of time to prepare for the 24-25 school year and a different calendar. At this time, I'm happy to take questions. Ms. McKee, we'll start with you. So thank you, Dr. Odie. Thank you, Dr. Odie, for this um, early warning. Um, I appreciate it. I think this calendar really does strike a nice balance from um, what you guys, what you know, from the various discussions that you guys have had. So thank you very much. I think this makes um, a good, good lot of sense. And um, I am so, I don't even recognize myself saying that. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's all right. It's okay. <laughs> Well, I appreciate you saying those things. <laughs> it's a new I mean, day. Me and a calendar fight. I mean, I don't, so I, I'm just looking at this like, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I think the only, you know, push, no, I'm just, it's great. I like it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. McKeever. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. McKeever. <laughs> Mr. Morris. I'll just say I was one of those in favor of the whole uh, Thanksgiving week off. That's all I'll say. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Morrisonberg. Oh, okay, Dr. Craig. It looks good to me. Thank you so much. Ms. Torres. Um, I just want to say thank you M more than anything because I've been waiting to hear Jennifer say something like that. So <laughs> <laughs> we did it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Mr. Johns. Um, I think that the um, calendar looks amazing. Um, I, I've had a, a few actually um, conversations um, in the past about what possibly an early start date could look like. Um, I think the way that you made this so it's an early, um, sorry, this mic's irritating me, uh, <laughs> that it's an early um, notice. So that way, like I said, parent, um, parents can um, look ahead and you know we have to make sure that students have supplies. And um, especially with the construction and everything now, we have to make sure that, that you know, we're, we're keeping everybody up to date and, and um, early on information. So um, I really appreciate you getting this to us um, early. So I know it takes a lot of work to do that. So um, thank you very much for that. But um, I'm very in favor of the calendar. Um, I think having it start a week early, I think the students would be very happy to end um, in May instead of June. Um, I know my brother will, his birthday's in June. So <laughs> I, I know he'll be happy about that and not having school in June. Um, but no, I think that this calendar looks amazing and I appreciate your hard work and your teams as well. Thank you. And I'm so sorry we didn't have this calendar in place while you were here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Dr. Ode. Um, great calendar. I think we did it once while I was here working at CHS. We got out in May, exact same ah. time. 
So this is getting the people loved it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, thank you. All right, um, 10.6, last but certainly not least, Beth Amazing. Last but certainly not least and quickest. I, I intend just to give you a quick update to, uh, to let you all know uh, the steering committee has been meeting a couple of different times. They keep, um, as you know, they've been doing a lot of foundational work around mission, vision, values, portrait of a graduate. In this last meeting that was yesterday, they also added uh, priorities, looking at ways of gathering that survey data and their own, their own perspectives into some big buckets of priorities, just like we had at the last strategic plan. I don't think they have uh, reached kind of a, a fixed uh, pl uh, place where they want to go public yet. I think they still probably have one more spiraling closer and closer and closer to the middle, but they are making progress. And I think that was apparent to the group yesterday. Uh, the work for the next couple of weeks shifts over to the executive leadership team where they then start building out corresponding, they, re, they refine these priorities, then they start building out corresponding goals and indicators to, to match the foundational work that the steering committee has put forth. In addition to that, we have focus groups yet to come and more uh, board uh, work time. So that's really all I, I have to bring to you tonight. I just wanted to give the update. And uh, I would also like to, my phone is ding, ding, dinging because a very person, important person to all of us just successfully defended her dissertation tonight. <laughs> Denise Johnson, that's Dr. Denise Johnson. Oh. Uh, we are so proud of her and uh, that's why my phone is dinging. Sorry, I couldn't put it down because I was too proud of her. But um, anyway, so that's my last more important update. We can, strategic plan is boring. Denise is exciting. <laughs> But anyway, I am happy to answer questions on either Denise or strategic plan right now. <laughs> Congratulations, Dr. Johnson. Her dissertation topic was on Charlottesville City Schools' response to the New York Times reporting in 2017. Okay. Congratulations, mm -hmm. Dr. Johnson. Congratulations. Any uh, other any questions? Questions, Mr. Johnson? The clock's ticking. I told you I was going to be fast. Right. So if you have any questions, get it in now. <laughs> um, no, no questions. However, um, I would like to say that that is my aunt. So um, yes. I'm extremely proud of her. Um, today, she's a doctor. And in about six weeks, I'll be graduating high school year early. So we are two very um, proud people of the accomplishments we're making. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm really proud of her. So if she's watching, I know she probably is after that. So um, I'm really proud of you. And um, thank you for telling me that. So I, uh, thank you. Well, one cannot be in conversation with Dr. Johnson, without knowing how proud she is of our school board rep right here. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Ms. Torres. Dr. Brown. No, thank you. Okay, Ms. Chandra. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving along. Our next um, item on the agenda is. Um, School Board Committee reports, and they have um, been submitted and duly noted. Now we have comments from members of the community. I'll start with Mr. Como. Do we have anybody in the Zoom room? Okay, no Zoom participants. Do we have anybody here in the audience who would like to come forth and speak? <laughs> now we'll have comments um, from the board. And I guess I'll start to my right, Ms. McKeever. Okay, thank you so much, um, Mr. Bryant. I wanted to, the only, um, you know, I, I don't know how to make, I know how hard the staff works, so it's making me so anxious to mention anything about the cell phone policy and even the parent communication, like I just, I don't know how to make it all happen for you all. Um, but these are, I don't, I do want, the public and the community to know that these are important issues that will continue to be important to us um, and that will, you know, our staff is just, as you can just imagine from all of tonight's updates have just been running at 110%. And I'm so grateful for them. Um, and I definitely, you know, still want to make sure that the, the public understands that the, you know, the communication and the cell phone work um, at the high school 
uh, is a priority, at least for me. And um, that to the extent that we ever get a breathing room, I'd like to make sure that that still remains a priority. But thank you all. Mr. Morris, Ms. Morrisonberg. Um, I just wanted to add, um, kind of following on that real quick, just um, because my kid is like, well, <laughs> so it's gonna be under construction when I'm there, I won't get to see the new school. So I am very interested in getting updates on what you know the on-site learning will look like um, for the children who are going through during the construction. Um, that would be nice to hear updates about that. So thank you. And thank everyone for all their hard work. Congratulations, Dr. Johnson. And congratulations, um, graduating one year early. Congratulations on that. Dr. Graff. Um, wow, yeah. There's so much going on. <laughs> really. Sometimes it makes my head spin. Um, I wanted to... Um, Thank, I guess I'm thanking Leslie and Dr. Gurley for um, giving us more information about visiting schools. Um, I think it's really great to have specific um, activities that we can go and observe. And, um, and along those lines, um, I just wanted to highlight um, <clears throat> an event today that I went to at Greenbrier. Um, it was so cool, and it actually brings us back to the KTEC uh, conversation. So this is um, uh, a healthy eating um, event um, at Greenbrier. And uh, so they had um, the culinary students from KTEC and the staff come uh, over there, and um, the students had already submitted like recipes for a healthy eating cookbook which actually has some good recipes that I'm going to try. And, um, but what was really neat was that the um, culinary students talked about um, their choices to go to KTEC and this career and why they like it. And, um, I, and the students were just so interested. So it, it just was a wonderful opportunity to combine those things. And I, I would love to see us be able to do more uh, to bring some of the KTEC students into our other schools, or maybe bring the other schools into KTEC to um, allow for these opportunities. I, I was sure that uh, we have some future chefs and cooks uh, out of this group. They were very, very interested and it was a wonderful event. Um, so I really appreciate that. And, um, the only other thing to mention is I am also very interested in getting this cell phone issue um, discussed and worked on, and I will volunteer to be on any committee uh, that we set up to, to do that. I think it's really important. Uh, and thanks to the staff for everything you do. And you guys are great. Ms. Torres. We are, we are lucky, aren't we? Mm -hmm. We have a great board and great staff, so thank you, everybody. Um, I, I, again, just wanted to elevate um, the work that we've done as a division, I think, in, in sharing um, the, the process of acquiring KTEC and what that looked like. Um, and, and I think we have done a, a great job, and I, I just again, want to ask, you know, all of the community, again, who, who support um, this type of programming and what it does for our students and the surrounding students to um, embrace this process, um, this new process and this new journey for us. And um, I, I wanna remind everybody kind of related to KTEC, but just, in general, how, the power of words and, and how they are used in public, in writing, can really make a difference. So I think we need to be careful in that. And, and um, you know, when we're talking about things, making sure that we have all of the information, um, because this is exciting times. Um, and, and these are, are people we're talking about and, and futures we're talking about. 
um, and it is exciting. So whether that, again, that be K-Tech, whether that be our new middle school, whether it be any program that we're, we're trying to support and uplift for our students. So, um, and thank you, Dr. Gurley, for all of your work um, with, with everything. So thank you. Mr. Johnson. Um, I just wanna say um, a big thanks to everybody. And, um, you know, it, it's great to see all the positive things going on within the school. Uh, it, it's, it's good to see after all the negative you hear um, in the public and, you know, within the school. So it's good to see some good um, things going on. Um, uh, I'm gonna end it here with, I'll probably say this, this meeting, I'll probably say every other meeting that I'm a part of. Um, our schools, uh, we graduate at over 90%. Um, and I wanna say, let's not make that a number. Um, our overall goal is to make sure that those 90, over 90% 90 of students that are graduating, not only are they a number that we put out in the media and put on our uh, page, but it's also um, those students are going through an experience that they can take with them um, when they graduate. Um, they're going through schools that they appreciate going to and have good memories in. Um, they're getting an education that not only they enjoy, but they're gonna use uh, after they turn 18. Um, that they're not over 90%, uh, when they look back on their uh, career here at CH uh, CHS and Buford and whatever uh, elementary school they go to, that they feel welcome in each one of those buildings and they feel like they gained something positively from each one of those buildings. Um, so let's make sure that, you know, in terms of um, reconstructing Buford and, um, and everything else that we're trying to uh, do for our students here, that the main goal here with all the whys and the, you know, the calendars, everything that we're trying to do is make sure that the over 90% of students that are graduating and the staff members that are here, they're leaving each year and every time they graduate, they're leaving with the experience that they can take on when they turn 18 and after, um, that they can tell their kids and whoever that um, their experience was a good one here at Charles City Schools. Okay, thank you all for your remarks. I just have a couple of things. In all my excitement a few minutes ago, I just wanted to make sure that I thank the city council for funding this Beaufort School project. Thank you, thank you, thank you, city council. We love you. <laughs> and also to the staff members, um, ladies, um, you are un unsung heroes because you're behind the scenes along with Dr. Gurley, of course he's out and about most of the time <laughs> in the schools, but, um, and these ladies here, making sure we are fed. Um, thank you all so much for all the hard work that you do. And I also wanna thank our community members who came forth tonight to speak and that come every month to speak to school board. We do hear you. Um, we do um, respect and admire your, your contributions, your, your input, and we value what you have to say. So thank you so much. And um, finally, I, I do think um, that we need to take a look at this cell phone policy. Maybe I'm a little old fashioned, but um, having taught in the schools and, you know, I know they can be a distraction, you know, so we have to come up with some, some way of um, meeting them in the middle. So those phones will not be a distraction to instruction in the classroom. And I think Ms. Horn will continue to come until we come up with some sort of solution to, to deal with that. It is a, a, a big distraction. And I, we hear it all over the state. Everybody talks about it. Educators everywhere talk about cell phones, how distracting they are. So again, thank you again, board members. Um, I was a little headed today because I got a little off a little bit, but appreciate your patience and your kindness. Thank you. Now I'll turn it over to Dr. Gurley. Uh, I'm really quick. I just want to, um, I work with some phenomenal ladies and gentlemen, um, and I'm just so appreciative. I think I say every time, but uh, I am better because of them, and we are all better because we all are better together. Um, so I'm just appreciative of, of the executive leadership team, the principals, the assistant principals, um, all the staff members, teachers, students, our families. Um, I appreciate, I read every email. Um, I return every phone call because every voice is valuable. Um, I am uh, was warm to see our athletes here this today. Um, we have some amazing students uh, on fields 
and also in classrooms. And um, Dr. Odig reminded me earlier about this, making sure we showcase some of the academics and we do, we need to make sure that people are seeing both um, because we have students who work hard on fields and also in classrooms. So we're gonna showcase that as well. And the equity cohort, I mean, how amazing is it to see people volunteer um, to have some very um, courageous conversations and, and do the work. Um, and so I'm very appreciative of them um, for just wanting to be better. And I'm most appreciative of Dr. Johnson for having the foresight to want to pull a group of people together and have that inaugural cohort. Um, and I just think I, I want to leave it with, um, you know, Langston Hughes talked about a dream deferred. And I know that when I was first eyeing Charlottesville, they were talking about reconfiguration, which made absolutely no sense to me. Like, what are we reconfiguring? <laughs> um, but I learned it was about putting the fifth graders at elementary and the sixth graders at the middle school. And no longer is that dream deferred that our all students will have access to an equitable facility, an innovative facility. And I am, um, as all of you all have said, I'm thankful for city council for their work, the staff members, um, you know, Mr. Rogers and his team for working directly with us each and every day. They, they also are responsive to us. So I'm appreciative, appreciative of them, but no longer is the dream deferred. Thank you all. All right, uh, Ms. Swift, are you ready to wrap us up here this evening? <laughs> yes, good evening. Um, so one quick thing to wrap up tonight's meeting, um, we are gonna ask that the high school cell phone committee uh, reconvene and we would like to ask, are there any board members that would like to join this committee? I know Dr. Kraft said earlier. Okay. Ms. Torres says she'll do it. All right. Okay. All right, thank okay. you. Thank you. Well, we have a couple of upcoming meetings on May 4th here in the Booker T. Reeves Media Center will be a school board meeting May 4th at five o'clock. On May 20th, we have our school board quarterly advance at 830 at Walker Up Elementary School. So I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. Is there, is there a motion? Second. All in favor? Aye. Meeting adjourned.